time for all time integration. This is the research area that started with my PhD. I didn't think it would go anywhere. It was an interesting theoretical problem. And uh, it turned out it was a, a very good subject to be involved in. It takes about a third to maybe 40% of my research time. It became a very active area of research. There is an annual conference now dedicated to this. There were 80 people at the last uh, conference in this area. And uh, I'd like to start with a few quotes on this area, which are historical quotes. The first quote is by Jörg Nievergeld. Nievergeld uh, was a professor at ETH in Zurich, where I studied. I've never had a course of his, even though he was still teaching when I was a student there. And when he was a postdoc, he wrote a, a paper where he said the integration methods introduced in this paper are to be regarded as a tentative example of a much wider class of numerical procedures in which parallelism is introduced at the expense of redundancy of computation. So in his vision at that time, uh, he was thinking that you have an infinite number of processors available. You can waste them however you want to. There's so many available, there's no limit. And so if you want to go fast, maybe you just have to recompute things several times to get algorithms that go faster than if you computed them once. So redundancy was his idea. We'll see his method, his uh, a visionary method, a little later in these lectures. And this was in 1964. It's a long time ago. Then there is a quote of Philippe Chartier and Bernard Philippe. This is funny because you have one is called Philip as a first name and one is called Philip as a last name. <laughs> So it's fairly easy to remember. I know Philippe Chartier very well. I've met Bernard Philippe only once in a conference in Paris about four years ago. He's not very active in research anymore. He was a famous professor in Rennes, and uh, he decided a few years ago to found a company and make money. So he stopped academia and he's becoming rich. Not as rich as Cleve Mulder from MATLAB, but I think he's becoming quite rich. So what did they say in their invention in 1993? It's quite a while after Nivergeld. Parallel algorithms for solving initial value problems for differential equations have achieved only marginal attention in the literature compared to the enormous work devoted to parallel algorithms for linear algebra. It is indeed generally admitted that the integration of a system of ordinary differential equations in a step-by-step -step process is inherently sequential. So what they say is that if you solve an evolution problem, and if you do this by time-stepping, there is nothing parallel to this process. You have to go one after the other. You cannot do those steps in parallel. It's just not possible. And that's why there is no work in that area. And they propose something that does this in parallel. You will see their algorithms later as well. And then this is the, the short paper that launched the whole research area again in 2001. By Jacques-Louis Lyon, this is the famous French mathematician whose son won the Fields Medal, Pierre-Louis Lyon. I saw one of his last lectures. He was already very ill. It was in Japan. And it's quite sad. Quite sad. It was a plenary lecture. And uh, after about 20 minutes, he was exhausted. And he just said to Roland Klovinsky, he said, these are good methods, but uh, he could not continue. He had uh, cancer and he died very soon later. Yvon Madé is a famous researcher in Paris, very, very well known. And Gabriel Turrici is less well known. And it's funny, when, when I talked about the method that they invented in Austria at the G17 conference, he was in the audience, one of the inventors. Actually, Ivo Madeo was in the audience as well. But he came later to me and he said, that was really interesting. I think I understand my algorithm now. <laughs> that was probably the biggest compliment I got in my career. So what do they say? They say la parallelisation qui en résulte se fait dans la direction temporelle, ce qui est en revanche non classique. So what they say is they have a parallelization method which parallelizes such problems in the time direction. It's exactly what you think it cannot be done. What they say cannot be done and what he says you need to do a redundant computation. So they invented a method that actually does it. And they say this is really not classical really not classical. So uh, w w why is this not supposed to work? Let's take a simple example. This is an example to, to, to show you what the causality principle is. The causality principle says that for an evolution problem, what happens later is determined by what happened earlier. 
and it's not going the other way around. For example, weather prediction, the weather system, what happens later is determined by what happened earlier. The clouds are moving forward. And never the weather earlier is influenced by what happened later. It's completely one directional. And to see this, we can take a simple example. This is a nonlinear ODE, a scalar ODE. We have a time derivative equals a nonlinear right hand side function f with the time spin g. We have some initial condition at some time t0. And to see it even more clearly, we can discretize this by an Euler discretization. So we approximate the derivative by a difference. If we let the delta t go to zero and the difference between tn plus one and tn is delta t, this is the definition of the derivative in the limit. So you replace this derivative in your equation by this difference. You multiply that delta t, you get a delta t and f, and you get a, a discrete scheme, which is the Euler scheme. If you know the initial condition v0, which you do, you can get an approximation after delta t. This is u1. And in this plot, you see how this works. We go from t0 to t1, t2 up to t12. There is the time axis here. We have the initial condition u0 here. And we performed one Euler step, so we get from here to here. This is an approximation of the solution. Now that we have u1, we can use u1 in this formula and get to u2. So we progress from u1 to u2. Now that we have u2, we can use u2 in the formula and we go to u3. And you see this is completely sequential. We go from here to here, then from here to here, then from here to here, and we just continue. I think Chartier and Bernard Philippe said this is a sequential process. There is nothing parallel about it. It does not seem possible you could do anything useful for U12 before you know U11, because U11 is in this formula to determine U12. If you don't know these steps, you cannot do the next one. That's what it seems like. And the subject of my lecture is to show you there are many algorithms that actually do exactly this. They try to calculate U12 before you have those. It's very counterintuitive. And when I read this paper of Ivo Made of 2001, my friends in Paris told me I should read it, I read it and I thought this is a completely useless method because I didn't see one of the convergent aspects of the method, which they also didn't have in their manuscripts, which only much later I, I managed to understand. So the topic of these lectures is exactly to calculate trajectories like this in parallel. And there are many people who try to do this. So this is a, a, a graph that shows um, the uh, y-axis gifts, 1960, 70, 80, 90, 2000, 2010, 2020. And then on the x-axis, we have large scale in the center. And then we have small scale on the right. And we have small scale on the, rest, on the left. This refers to problems. Large scale problem is a problem that has like millions of unknowns in space. And a small scale problem is a problem that has only very few unknowns in space, maybe just one, like in my drawing before. And then there are many colors here. There are actually four colors plus one. And these colors encode different types of methods. There are the magenta methods that start with Niebergeld, we've seen a quote of his. And this is in the direct method category, direct method. These are methods that don't iterate on the solution, but nevertheless calculate such trajectories in parallel. That even feels less intuitive. That virtually feels like not possible to have a direct method of calculation in parallel. And then on this side, there are iterative methods. Now for iterative methods, you can think maybe there's something you can do. You iterate on these unknowns. There is some miracle that makes it contract at the end while it already contracts at the beginning. And so these methods that were started by Niebergeld, which were a direct method, then became Bellin and Zanarov and Chartier and Philippe, iterative methods, and they became very famous methods that we'll see in a chapter of this talk. Then are the red methods. The red methods started with uh, an idea to prove existence and uniqueness of solutions of such problems by Picard and Jean Deleuze. They became computational methods at IBM in 1992, and then they were developed in the red track. And then there's the blue track. The blue, blue track are multi-grid type methods. It's a 
very good idea by Wolfgang Habusch, who is one of the two great founders of multigrid methods. The other one is Archie Brandt. And they really didn't like each other. I know from Gerhard Mander that they met at the conference and it was very <laughs> unpleasant. And I think the reason is that they work very differently. Hackbush is, is working at the uh, analytical level. He is proving results with a Cylon Delta technique. It's very, very hard, precise analysis. Where Aki Brandt somehow feels this should work and this should not work, but you cannot quite prove it, but it's correct in general. And this is similar to the two scientists in Geneva for which I wanted to go to Geneva, Ernst Heyer and Gerhard Wander. Ernst Heyer is more like Huck Bush and Gerhard Wander is more like Aki Brandt. And the good thing they did is they worked together. And they wrote books that will remain forever in the several research areas. They're really, really good scientists both. So it's a shame that they did not like each other. This algorithm is very interesting, but it has a fundamental flaw, which I will show. And the flaw has remained has remained for a long time, people tried to fix it. And it took a while until there was a good algorithm that is a multi-grid space science that's really, really good. It's probably the best one I can show you here at one conference. And then there are the direct methods. These are the flash methods. And you see the many, many, many direct methods. Surprisingly, many, many direct methods. So these are the methods I'd like to show you. So wh why do these methods become important these days? It's because the computers that we have available now have too many processors. They just have too many processors. You cannot use all these processors anymore. This is the top 500 list in June 2022. I'm a bit sad about this list because when I started working on a book on the subject four years ago, the top 500 list contained a Swiss supercomputer. <laughs> so I was very proud of that. There's a Swiss supercomputer here at Lab Plus 204. The first two computers were Chinese. So this list changes quite a bit. Now the top computer is the United States. The next one is Japan, Finland, United States, United States. United States is again on top. And you see the number of cores is 8 million, 7 million. And then there is this Finland that only has 1 million. But it still made it into the top. The Swiss one only had 750,000. So very, very good engineering to make it into speed into the top list. Then you have 2 million, you have 1.5 million. These are enormous differences. There are so, so many processes, you cannot reach them effectively on a problem. And that's why you want to parallelize not just in space, but also in time. You use the time direction to use more processes to get the fastest solution possible. So I will use uh, several model problems during this course, and I will want to explain to you what the model problems are. The first type of model problem is the uh, OD. So this is the same problem that we've seen in the cartoon, but now we could have several unknowns. It could be two, three, ten. There's a time derivative. The unknown is u. We have a nonlinear right-hand size function here. We want to solve this problem on a time interval of zero t. And we have an initial condition. And the problem I will use is a problem from Edward Lawrence from 1979. And he was working on uh, weather prediction ordinary di uh, differential equations. And there is a, a paper where he says that the first ta task was to find a suitable system of equations to solve. In principle, any nonlinear system might do. But a system with some resemblance to the atmospheric equations offered the possibility of some useful byproducts. And this somehow reminds me when I gave a first talk in Geneva about this subject. In the audience, there was Ekman was a professor in physics. He's the supervisor of Martin Heyer, who won the Fields Medal a few years ago, who is the son of Ernst Heyer, who is professor in Geneva. And he said, you should have a, a, a much better model problem. Take the Lorentz equation. And that's why we have the Lorentz equation. It's one of the model problems now. So here are the Lorentz equations. This is three unknowns. So in contrast to my first example, we have now three unknowns. But you see, each has a time derivative, which is denoted by a dot. And on the right-hand side, there is some nonlinear function. The x time derivative that depends on x and y, there is a parameter called sigma, the real number. There is an initial condition for x. For y, there is also dependence on z, x, and y with some other parameters, initial condition, and so on. So that's the Lorentz system. Who knows something about the Lorentz system in the audience? Nobody's seen that system before. 
completely new. It's a very famous system because Lorentz was working on solving such systems approximately, and he had a computer available. And computers were very slow at that time. So one day he calculated all day. He had an Euler-type method. He moved forward, 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 forward. And evening he wanted to go home. So he wrote down the solution that he had achieved so far to four digits accuracy. And the next morning he came again and he continued computing. And this system had a very bizarre solution. It had a solution that looked like this. So here you have the three coordinates, x, y, and z. And he started somewhere and he calculated. And the system somehow circles in parts of the phase space, then circles in other parts. You go back and forth, back and forth. And it has fixed points, which are marked here with red points, where it's not moving. And uh, a week later, he wanted to recalculate the solution just to make sure all was correct. And this time, he just let run his computer. He said, I'm not going to write down. And he got a completely different solution. Nothing was the same. And he did not understand why. And the reason why that happened is this is a chaotic system. So if you change this starting point by a slight epsilon, after only a short part of the trajectory, the solution will bifurcate. It's not going to be the same. And it will be completely different. So you cannot predict in which part of this wing of the so-called butterfly the solution will be. A small change here has an exponentially large change immediately after a short time. And because this is a very simple model for pressure in the atmosphere, Lorentz then said that this is exactly like weather prediction. If you do a small change somewhere, this can have a very large change somewhere else. And he said the fly of a butterfly in Europe could cause a thunderstorm in the US. That's the saying of Lorentz for this system. And so Ekman said I should use this system to do time parallel time integration because this is not very easy to do because it's very sensitive to what you do in the initial condition in the future. So this is one of the model problems I will use. Then I will use the Dahlquist test equation. This is a test equation which is very useful to understand algorithms. It's much simpler than the Lorentz equation. It's just one unknown u, the scalar like on my first drawing, and it's a linear equation. So it's just lambda times u, and lambda is a number. In general, it's a complex number, but since it's such a simple system, you can just integrate it. Solution is an exponential function of lambda times t, and the initial condition is just multiplied here, u0. So if lambda is a real number that's positive, then solutions are growing exponentially. They're just growing exponentially. If lambda is a real number that's negative, they're just decaying exponentially. If it's an imaginary number, they oscillate the solution, because you have an imaginary number here. And if it's in general a complex number, then the real part determines if the solution is growing or decaying. So if we approximate this system with an Euler method, the forward Euler method we've seen on the first transparency, then we get a formula like this. The <coughs> approximation at the new time step is the approximation at the old time step plus delta t times lambda u. So this is 1 plus delta t lambda and this function here, this is in general called R of Z, where Z is this lambda delta T, R of Z, and this is the stability function of the method. So I indicate by forward Euler, this is the stability function of forward Euler, this is this method. And now we have a, a very interesting observation that we could make. If the original solution of this problem is decaying, which means that the real part of lambda is negative, which means if I do a drawing here of the real part and imaginary part of lambda delta t, which is the z, then for all values which are in the next, in the left part of the complex plane, the exact solution is decaying. Because here my lambda has a negative real part. So for all these values, part, I know my solution is decaying. The physical behavior is loss of energy. Now we can look what happens with the numerical method. Now for the numerical method to have a decaying solution, we need that this 
factor here in modulus material n1. It is only then the un becomes smaller when it becomes un plus 1. It's multiplied by something which is smaller than 1. Now, where is this function less than 1? It's when this is less than 1. And this is also depending on lambda delta t, and it's in this disk. So provided that lambda delta t is in this disk, your numerical solution does physically correct behavior. But if lambda delta t is outside, then it does physically the wrong thing. So that's a very important property of the numerical discretization of this equation, and that's one of the reasons why Dahlquist's equation is so important. It tells you if solution it will do physically the correct thing, or you say just go high wire. Now if you do backward Euler, this is a, 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 a method where you put n plus 1 here, one could do the same drawing. And what happens here is that backward Euler is physically correct for all values in the negative complex plane. So whenever solution decays, backward Euler is correct. But when solutions are growing, then backward Euler is wrong. Because here it's still decaying. It indicates that your physical system is losing energy, but it does not. It should be growing. So these numerical methods have a problem. And how is this fixed? This can be fixed by make, making delta t small. Because if you make delta t small for a given lambda, this lambda delta t goes closer and closer to zero. And so wherever your lambda is, if you multiply it by delta t, it's going to approach zero. So eventually it gets into this circle, and it's going to be correct. And also here, eventually it gets into this circle, it's going to be correct. These are both convergent methods. But if your time step is too large, it's going to be physically wrong. And it in, in, in induces you to error when you do numerical solutions. That's an important thing to know, and this you'll use again later for other problems and also in time parallel methods. And I will use the heat equation. The heat equation is a very nice equation that was invented by uh, Joseph Fourier in uh, 1822 in his uh, treatise, uh, La Théorie Analytique de la Chaleur. It's amazing, he finds the partial differential equation and he solves the partial differential equation. And to do so, he invents Fourier series. That's the invention of his Fourier series, Fourier transform. It's, it's an amazing achievement, intellectual achievement. A few weeks ago, I read a comic book about Fourier that I found in the mass center where I'm on sabbatical at the moment in Marseille. And so the example we will use is a, an example where I have a nail in between two ice cubes. So the temperature of the nail at the boundary is zero because it touches the ice cube. And in the middle, I can put some temperature. I will put 20 degrees because I assume we're in a room. And so the nail is at 20 degrees, and it's cooled to zero on both ends. And I want to see what happens to this nail. How does it cool down? So the domain here is from zero to L. And I want to solve the problem in the domain zero L, zero T. And here is the heat equation. That's the invention of Fourier. A time derivative on the left equals two spatial derivatives on the right. This is a Laplace operator in 1D. And there is some initial conditions, some initial temperature. And there are two boundary conditions, which are zero here and here. This is a model problem I will use as well. And I just want to show you how the solution looks like of this model problem. And for this, I have a MATLAB implementation. Somewhere. And the first one I do, you see, it's a forward Euler. It's a forward Euler example. So here you can see this is the nail. And uh, I have a zero temperature here, a zero temperature here. I start at 20 degrees. And now it just solves this equation approximately with a backward forward Euler method in time and centered finite differences in space. And we just solve and we look. And this 
see the nail becomes coated. You can also see the mesh size. I didn't use many mesh points here. You can see it cools down. And this is what you expect, you know, it's cold on the side, this cold will go into the nail. In the middle it's still 20 degrees, so it's still uh, warm, but it's cooling, it's cooling. It's not very fast. It's cooling down, it's cooling down. This is how a nail cools if you hold it to zero degrees on both sides, and you start at 20 degrees. And what you see appearing is the first sine function. That's how Curie invented sine to transform. You see, this is the first sine sine bump that you can see appear. This is very much related to the to the heat equation. So now I, I will do something. I do a small change. I will just use. You can see here. I will just use a little less steps in sine. I will make delta t slightly bigger. Just a tiny bit. Instead of 2,000, I used 1,980. So very tiny modification. And I just run the same program again. So you see it starts again. Now we start the heat equation. It cools nicely down, exactly as before. And now you see it starts to feel uneasy. There's definitely no way that the temperature would be there. And what I did is, you, you remember I made this delta t slightly bigger. I've shown you with the Dahlquist equation, if I get out of this circle where it's physically correct, and that's what I did, I just pushed it out, and now there is no hope. This solution is completely incorrect physically, it's blowing up. So that's why the Dahlquist equation is very important. That's where you learn when methods behave physically correctly, or if they go wrong. So I can also do this solution with backward Euler. So I have a backward Euler implementation. And I run it. And I run it with a very big time step. Here you see it goes much, much faster. And nothing happens. Because backward Euler is never physically wrong if the solution is the same. It's always correct. So I can do very big steps very quickly. I get to the sine function. So one good thing to know about these two methods. <coughs> so here is just the same picture now. <coughs> Push forward the backward Euler. So the heat equation is one example that we will use. Another example we'll use is the wave equation. <coughs> this equation was invented even before by uh, Jean-Baptiste uh, Laurent d'Alembert. And it's not really correct to say invented because he discovered it by studying wave phenomena. And it's very similar to the heat equation. If you look at the equation, it also has a Laplacian, uh, but it has two derivatives on the left instead of one. If you put one, it's the heat equation. If you put two, it's the wave equation. Because you have two derivatives, you also need two initial conditions. You need the value and the derivative. You know. And you also need some boundary values on the boundary. And I take as an example here, uh, a string which is in between two walls. So I fix the position of the string here. So I have also a zero boundary condition here, like for the heat equation. I start with a zero impulse, which means I basically hold the string in the middle, like this, and I'll just let it go. So I have initial position, which is u zero, which is this position, and I impose the wave equation for the motion. Now when I do this, this string does not behave at all like what it should. So I will not show you a calculation for this example, but I will tell you what I did when I taught this for the first time four years ago. It was an evening, I was preparing my class, and I knew this is ac accepted as being the wave equation. I wanted to have a musical instrument, so I programmed this, I let it go, and it looked completely wrong. And I needed my lecture for tomorrow. So I sort of panicked and I thought, what's wrong with this model? This equation is no good. I've learned this in my class. I've always used it. But for this example, it's wrong. And so I just thought what I need to change in this equation and I have a lot of experience with TVs. And I added the term. And the term was a UTXX term. And then it did what it's supposed to do. What it's supposed to do is it's supposed to become the first sign that oscillates because you're retarded. That's what it does. It 
So this is the first sine, first sine wave that makes the right switch. And then I taught it, and I could not quite explain where this term is coming from. And then I asked Patrick Jolie in Paris, because he had given a talk about the simulation of the grand piano a few months before. And that was an insane talk. He did an entire simulation of a grand piano, which starts with the hammer that has an impulse on the string. Then he simulated the string. He simulated how the vibration from the string through a wooden support goes into the plate of the grand piano, how this plate starts vibrating, how the 3D environment starts vibrating in the air, and how a microphone would pick up the sound. And then he played the sound, and it was mind-boggling. He was thinking it was a piano. So one sound takes 13 hours currently to <laughs> simulate it with that model. And then he played Chopin. And you would not believe it was so real. It was so real. And then he changed a few parameters in the PDs and he played Chopin again, and it was a different piano. But, but you were sure it was a piano. It was just a different one. And so I sent him a mail and said, I have a problem. I added this term. What do you think about it? And then he said, yeah, that's well known. You need viscous damping. Otherwise, this model is wrong for the string. It's just not well known. But So now I know. So I will not show you this example, but I'll show you another example where it looks good. And this is also a typical example that one sees for the wave equation. I think it's good if you see the wave, exa <coughs> wave equation also visually. Let me bring this to. So here is a wave equation, but you see I don't pluck it like this because, because then it doesn't do what it's supposed to. But what I do is I do just a, a Gaussian pulse. And then I let it go, the Gaussian pulse. I still have it fixed here and here. And if you could impose this on a string, then it would do this, because the viscoelastic damping is not so important for this belief. So what it does, you can look. It splits into two. One goes to the left, one goes to the right. You see at the left there is a reflection. It's coming back, and it's coming back with the other sign because it's a beautiful condition. And now it gets to the right, and it's coming back. Because now it merges with this pulse, and you get the same pulse. And it splits again, it continues, and it goes like this forever. That's what the wave equation does. And that's what you sort of see in the swimming pool. If you're the first person in the morning and you just jump in, then you have these little waves that go everywhere. And these waves are going to stay, and you think it's going to be forever. Except if nobody goes in and you wait long enough, it becomes flat, flat again. And the reason why it becomes flat is this viscous damping. But the viscous damping can be neglected for these sorts of waves. The, the, the thing is correct. It's just if you wait long enough. So that's also a model we will use in this, uh, in this lecture. So here is just a picture of this. Then we will use the transport equation or the advection equation that's an even simpler equation than the wave equation, but it's also a good model problem. It's also a hyperbolic problem, like the wave equation. Here we just have one derivative, and we also have one derivative in space only. And here A gives the C, like in the wave equation, the T squared. We also have a boundary condition, but only on one side. Depending on the sign of A, we have to have a boundary condition on the left or on the right. We have an initial condition. And in my example, I assume A is positive. So this equation has a solution that moves from the left to the right. And you can actually see the solution just by inspection. Any function which depends on x minus at is this solution of this equation. And why is this? If, if this is a solution, it must satisfy the equation that if you take a time derivative and you add a times the spatial derivative, you should get if f is 0, 0. So this is a solution for f equals 0. And you can see we can just calculate the time derivative. It's minus a times d prime. And then plus a times the spatial derivative is a times d prime. Nothing coming out because nothing in front of x. And these exactly cancel because plus a and minus a. So any function that looks like this is a solution. And this tells you that the solutions of this equation 
they're staying constant when x minus a t is constant. And x minus a t constant is a line in the x t plane. And this line is called the characteristic line. And so if the solution here is 5, then the solution of this PD remains 5 if f is 0 along this characteristic line. And if here it's 7, it remains 7. And if it's here 3, it remains 3. So any initial profile will just move like this at this two phase. And if you want to know the solution here, then you need a, a value at this boundary to know what the solution is here. And you cannot impose any value here because everything is determined by what's coming. This is the transport of the effective simple hyperbolic equation that we know. I also have an example so you can see how it runs. Where did I go? Oh, here we go. See, this was exactly this transport. I started with some signal here. It just goes from the left to the right. And the exact solution is this red line, which I can write down because it's just a function g. And I have a numerical solution blue. And you see it's exactly under exact solution. This equation has a numerical discretization that gives you the exact solution. There are not many PDs that have a discretization that gives you exact solution. This was a forward Euler swing here an upwind space di uh, discretization. If I use a backward Euler scheme, uh, it's not, not so good. <laughs> you see we lost a lot of the signal. It's physically not wrong. It does not oscillate, but it really lost a lot of the signal. And then there are other schemes which you bet better don't use because they just don't work. So th this one looks very good, but it lo it's lost all the solution here. There's no, there's no point anymore because it produces not the numbers. So there are many schemes that don't work for this equation. It's a good test equation as well for the algorithms that we'll see. So these are the pictures I've shown. And then there are combinations of these terms that we've seen. This is called the advection reaction diffusion equation. This is a more complex problem than what we've seen so far. It has one time derivative here. And it has a transport term. This is the A times Cx term, but now in higher spatial dimensions. So A is now a vector which gives you the transport C anywhere in 3D space. The gradient is the same term as the Dx was before. We have a heat equation term with a diffusivity mu. This is the Laplacian from Fourier. We can also have a reaction term. Here I have a linear reaction term. A is a parameter. So I have a source function. So this has the same type of initial condition and boundary condition as the heat equation had. And there are many, many possibilities. So this transport A, it can be given transport from some flow calculation in a river. And then you put dye into the river and you see how this dye goes and how it diffuses. But it can be even worse. This speed can depend on you itself, like in the Navier-Stokes equation. And that's how turbulence is formed in this Navier-Stokes equation, because the speed is determined by itself moving velocity field. The diffusion I explained, the reaction coefficient here have a linear reaction. It could be a nonlinear term. For example, if chemical chemicals would merge and, and react and produce other chemicals. So this is the uh, advection reaction diffusion equation. We'll see an example later on an algorithm. And now for the introduction, I have a last thing I want to show you. I've shown you these four colors. I didn't mention the green color so far. These are review papers on these methods. I wrote the review paper in 2015 about these methods. But I want to show you where these methods come from, not for the time parallelization, but from another area of calculation. So for each of the four colors, I show you now where the idea is coming from. And I will try to explain why it seems not useful for time parallelization. So the first method, the magenta methods, they are methods that come from multiple shooting or from shooting methods in general. Is there anybody who has heard about shooting methods so far? This is something you see often in numerical analysis course. You know, that I see there is some, some feeling about shooting. So wh what is shooting? Shooting is a very interesting method I learned from Joe Keller. 
and his brother wrote a famous book about this. So a shooting method. So the shooting methods were developed for boundary value problems like the problem up there. It's a problem that has just one component u. It's a scalar unknown. And we have, for simplicity, a Laplace operator on the left, so two derivatives. On the right, there is some nonlinear function f. And we have two boundary values. And this is exactly what we have here. There's one boundary value is here. And one boundary value is here. And this is basically the solution that we want to calculate. Oh, my boundary value is moved from this one. Let's go back. And so at the time when these methods were developed, it seemed to be a bit hard to solve this boundary value problem. So there were problems that were much easier to solve, initial value problems. So if you have initial data here, then it was quite easy with an Euler method to produce an approximate trajectory. And so what shooting methods do is they replace this problem by first forgetting about where you're supposed to go. But instead, in addition to this value, you also impose a slope. So now you see where shooting is coming from, the name. It, it's like a gun. And you try to guess a good slope to get to this target. So if you choose this slope, uh, we're a little bit too low. So you need, need to go higher up, so you choose this slope. And then you go, and then, then you're too high up. But this is very cheap to calculate. You just use an Euler method, you go. And, and, and now you know it's in between, so you go in between. So then you go too low. And then you go a little bit too high, and then eventually, eventually hit the target. That's the shooting method. Now, if this was an initial value problem, like the Lorentz equation, there is no target. There is nowhere to shoot at. And you know already the slopes here. You know, you know all the starting values. You just calculate one of them. So this seems completely useless to be time parallelized. So there's no, no way you think it can, it can be used. Because you just do it once and you have your solution. But nevertheless, there will be a class of methods that's based on this idea, which I will explain. These are the magenta methods. Here is just the cartoon of the shooting. Then the red methods are based on domain decomposition. Domain decomposition methods are an area where I've done a lot of work. These are methods also and not for time-dependent problems. But also for elliptic problems, I can take exactly the same problem that I used for shooting. Two boundary values are given, and the domain 0L. And what these methods do is they decompose the spatial domain into subdomains. For example, a Schwartz method would take overlapping subdomains. And then you're only allowed to calculate solutions on the subdomain. You're not allowed to calculate the solution everywhere, only on subdomains. And what Schwartz did, he, he just started on the first subdomain. And because he doesn't know what the value is of the solution here, he just starts with something, for example, 0. So if you know that the value should be 0 here, and if you know this is the correct value g, you can solve your problem on the first subdomain, and you get an approximate solution. Now, the real solution you want to get to is this one. But since we don't know that it has to go through here, we have to start with something. So this is a little wrong. But you can calculate on a smaller domain. And then you use this value along this interface here to calculate the solution on the second subdomain. And so you calculate here. And now you see we're already a little better. We're closer to the solution. So, so let's do it here again. And we get closer. Let's do it here again and here again. And eventually you converge. That's what's called the alternating Schwartz method. Alternating because you solve left, right, left, right, left, right. You could also do this in parallel. You could start with two values and then both subdomains solve. And you exchange and both solve both. If you have 100 subdomains, you can use 100 processors and 100 things solve. And uh, hopefully you converge to the solution. That's what domain decomposition methods do. Now again, if, if this was a, an evolution problem, you would not have a GL, there is no, no target here. So when you do your first solve, there is nothing you have to impose here. So the first solve, you just solve, and then you pick the value and you solve, and, and you finish. So this also seems completely useless in parallelized evolution problems. So 
But there is a second class of methods, the rep methods, that do this in some way, in a useful way for time-dependent problems. Then there is a third class of methods. These are the multigrid methods. Who has seen multigrid methods in the audience? Okay. Don't, 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 uh, not, not need to be worried. I will not ask you questions about multigrid. I just want to know if anybody has heard about multigrid. So I see there is some knowledge about multigrid. Multigrid is a beautiful method. I can show you for this problem as well what they do. This is a Laplace problem again. I just do it linear now. For simplicity, it can be defined for nonlinear problems as well. So for multi-grid methods, you need a grid. So far, I did not discretize for the other methods, but now I need to discretize multi-grid. So I impose a grid on this interval. I impose uh, grid points. I discretize the Laplace operator with finite differences, which gives a minus 2, 1, 1 stencil. Everybody's seen this stencil? I think this stencil is seen. Right? This is just a discretization of this second derivative by a double difference to the left and to the right. So I get the equivalent discrete problem to this continuous problem here. And then what you need in multigrid, you need two components. You need a smoothing iteration and your course correction. So to get a smoothing iteration, you take this matrix and you cut it into three pieces. There is a diagonal piece. This is the minus 2 over hi. This is just the diagonal of this matrix. And then you have L is the lower triangular part. This is just this 1 to the 1 over h squared. And an upper triangular part, which is just the 1 above the diagonal with the 1 over h squared. So you have these three matrices. And now the first thing you need for a multigrid method is a smoothing iteration. And for this, you either use Jacobi or gauss L. Jacobi iteration means you keep the diagonal on the left, and you put the lower and upper triangular part to the right, and then you iterate like this. This is a stationary iteration invented by Jacobi in uh, 1848. Or you can use the gauss seidel stationary iteration, which means you, this L, you keep it on the left as well. So you have L plus E, UK plus 1 is minus UK plus F. And they're both very cheap. Here you just have a diagonal, so this is very cheap to execute. You just have to divide every equation by the diagonal element. It's very cheap. And here is almost as cheap. You have a lower triangular matrix. It is also very cheap to solve. So as cheap as this. So this is parallel. You can divide all diagonals at once, whereas this is sequential. You have to go one after the other. And here is a nice quote by Edward Stiefel. There is a, a beautiful paper by Stiefel about conjugate gradient methods and Kralov methods in general. And what he says is, so dass der positive Residualberg mit dem Löffel statt mit einer Bagger-Maschine abgetragen wird. So he says, these methods are really useless. <laughs> so what he shows is that if you use such a method on this Laplace problem, the first two or three steps, they work really well. Somehow the error and the residual goes down. But then suddenly they slow down. And instead of removing the residual with a, with a mechanical caterpillar, you, you remove it with a spoon. It's just not making any progress. And this is also true for what's called the damped Jacobi method. The damped Jacobi method is this method, but you are damped, add damping. And to see how you are damping, I just rewrite this method. So I multiply through by D inverse. Then I get this relation. I have a D inverse on this part, and I have a D inverse on F. And now I collect the separate terms. So I have a UK, which comes from this part here, multiplied with the entire matrix, which was L plus U, can be formulated as A. And I get as a remaining term here the residual. And then to add damping, you just multiply this residual term with some parameters. So this iteration, if I put Omega equals 1 is exactly this iteration, these are the terms. But here is some damping. And also with damping, this is true. These methods are really no good to solve this equation. But they're a fundamental uh, uh, ingredient for multigrid. Why is this? So here is the Laplace equation, which I've shown you before on the interval 0, 1. And I start with some random initial guess. You see this oscillates quite a bit. And I have no source term f, so my solution is basically 0. And I run Jacobi on it. And I have th three different variants of Jacobi. I have Jacobi with 
one as the relaxation parameter, that's the original Jacobi method, or with two thirds, or with one half. And I just run the method. And so here I have the first iteration, second iteration, third iteration. So you see, th this is not making much progress. That's what Stiefel said. The residual of the error is, is not becoming small. And this is also true here. It's also not making much progress. And also here it's not making much progress. The error stays large, but it's not something fundamental here. These two look very different from this one. This one still oscillates like at the beginning. Whereas this one here, all the oscillations have disappeared. And here as well. And so the idea of multigrid is to use this method, which is completely useless as a solver, do two or three iterations, and then all high frequency error has disappeared. And this signal is so smooth that you don't need all the grid points anymore to represent it. It's enough to use half the number of grid points here, and you still have a very good representation of it. Now you say, then I have to solve the problem now with half of the grid points. But that's already half as big as the original problem. That's cheap. So the multigrid method is doing exactly this. The multigrid idea is to apply a few smoothing steps, using, for example, Jacobi with damping or Gauss Seidel. Then you calculate the residual. You restrict it to a coarse mesh. You do a coarse solve. You prolongate it with a fine mesh, and you add your correction. And maybe you do again a few smoothing steps after this, and you iterate on this. That's a two-grid method. And you see the performance is spectacular. So here I've shown you exactly the first few smoothing steps like on the previous transparency with a half or omega. And the course correction goes here from here to here. So this whole mountain is removed in one go. It's just gone. And then I do a few smoothing steps. I do again a, a course correction that you can almost not distinguish anymore. And in the third iteration, the error has disappeared everywhere. So this two grid iteration is tremendously successful for such types. Tremendously successful. Except you can say now this course problem, I still need to solve it. But I can use recursion. This course problem is again a Laplace problem with half the number of points. So instead of solving it, I do again just a few Jacobi steps, and I take again half the number of points, and a few Jacobi steps, and again half the number of points, until my problem has four points or eight points, and then I just solve, and I go back. That's the multigrid idea. It's by far the best solver for Laplace type problems. It cannot beat it. It needs 38 floating, 28 floating point operations per unknown, independently of the size and dimension of your problem. This needs to think, sink in for a moment. You can have a 3D problem with a billion unknowns. For every unknown, you do 28 floating point operations to get the solution. It's just insane. This was proved by Greenberg in his PhD thesis. A famous professor in uh, Germany. So this is by far the best solve for a Laplace type problem. Now, in this problem, there was no time. Steady problem. The last methods are the direct time parallel methods. And for a direct time parallel method, what you need to do, you take some model problem, like the one I had before. I discretize, for example, with backward dialer. Now if I want a direct method, I need to write this not as a time stepping method, but all the equations at once. The first time step, the second time step, the third time step, I write them all at once. So here is the first time step the second time step, the third time step, if I take all of those at once, I get a big nonlinear function that has all time steps in it at once. And I want to solve this to be zero from this time step E2. And I want to do this by a direct method. Now you see, I'm really out of luck because if you have a nonlinear system to solve, there is no direct method to solve. You use Newton's method or some iteration. You cannot solve it by a direct method. So this doesn't look very promising as an approach. But uh, I could assume I have a linear problem and do this. 
So if I take a linear problem, so if I replace my nonlinear function by a linear problem, and I write all these systems at once, then I indeed get a linear problem. So how do you solve linear matrix equation? You do a Gaussian elimination or something, LU factorization. But this is already a lower triangular matrix. So if I want to solve this by a direct method, this is a lower triangular matrix. I just do forward substitution. So I solve one after the other. This is again time sensitive. So direct methods also don't look like very promising for such problems. They don't bring anything new algorithmically to you. So some I've shown you that all these four things do not look promising on time dependent problems. Nevertheless, there is all this research, all these efforts, and the rest of this course is devoted to show you that you can get something from this. So I think I can start with the first class of methods, which are the shooting methods in time. These are the magenta methods. These two time parallel solutions of these evolution problems, they solve parallel in time, and they're based on a decomposition in time. So here is a cartoon that shows you how they decompose. So the spatial domain rain remains the whole domain, but time is cut into intervals. And then you try to calculate simultaneously the solution here, 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 and here, doing useful work. Exactly what it seems was not possible. And the first is Niebergelt who tried to do this. And here is the second quote, which I like, of Jörg Niebergelt. For the last 20 years, one has tried to speed up numerical computation mainly by providing ever faster computers. Today, and this is in 1964, today, as it appears that one is getting closer to the maximal speed of electronic components, emphasis is put on allowing operations to be performed in parallel. So in the near future, much of numerical analysis will have to be recast in a more parallel form. And that was in 1964. Now, 1964, I have a graph here. It starts at 1985, and it goes up to 2010. So 64 is somewhere here. 64. And he already knew that the speed of electronic components, at some point, it's going to stop increasing. But it was like 40 years later. And at that point, he already said, we need algorithms that are going to be good at that stage, and he invented one. It's not a good one. I will explain it to you. It's not a good one. But the idea is really spectacular. He foresaw it, and you can see now in 2004, in 2004, suddenly speeds are dropping. You cannot go faster, and the only way to go faster is by increasing the number of cores. You need to increase the number of transistors on each chip. It's the only way to go faster. What's Niebergeld's method? So we want to solve this OD, one unknown, nonlinear, on the interval 0t. So now time is here. This is the axis that's of interest to plot. And this method has, has, has a, is a two-step procedure. It's a direct solver. It produces the solution of the two steps. So the first thing you do is you decompose the interval into time subintervals, like I had on my cartoon. And then you have a rough approximation to your solution that you calculate, for example, with forward Euler. That's very cheap. So you do one forward Euler step from here to here, another one from here to here, another one from here to here, another one from here to here. You have an approximate trajectory which is not very good because it's a big Euler step. But you know approximately where solution is going to, approximately. And now Niebergeld says I have an unlimited amount of processes available. Let's just waste them. And so he generates around every approximate point a cloud of blue points. And from each of these starting points, he calculates a very expensive accurate trajectory. For example, with a high order on the Kuta method. This can be all done in parallel. See, there's not, no interdependence. This solution can be calculated at the same time as this one, as this one, and also one from this initial point. So these he calculates all in parallel. And now that he has all these parallel trajectories, he wants to patch together a better solution than the red one. And the way he does it is in this recombination step. What he does is he looks in between which two points of his cloud this value was. And then he takes these two trajectories and he does the same average 
that each point needs for t two points at the end point. You see, that's a little wrong. In a linear case, that would be actually correct. You would get the exact solution. But in the nonlinear case, it's a little wrong. So he, he interpolates among the points he has to find the new point here. Then he interpolates to find a new point here. He interpolates to find a new point here. This is, again, sequential. But interpolation is really cheap. It's just a linear combination. So he has a very cheap step for Euler. Then he has a very expensive but completely parallel step for the blue trajectory. And then he does just linear interpolation and finds the solution. Now, this is not a very practical method because suppose you have two components. Then you have already a cloud of two-dimensional points. If you have a PD, you have an infinite dimensional cloud of points. There's just no way to make this practical. But the idea is a, a real vision. It's a real vision. For two, one, two nodes, it's a parallel method. And it really gets you the solution faster. It gets a good approximation. He has error estimates, but to generalize to higher dimensions, there is uh, not much promise. But here is a method that does this for higher dimensions. And the idea is very similar. This is Philippe Chartier and Bernard Philippe, you see people with the same name. Now what they say is we study different modifications of a class of parallel algorithms initially designed by Bellin and Zenaro, two Italians, very well known in the OD community, for different equations and called across the set method by their authors for the purpose of solving initial value problems in ordinary differential equations on a massively parallel computer. And so the idea is to adapt a shooting method shooting method which was developed like I've shown you for boundary value problems, but now to initial value problem, where there is no target. There's nothing to hit. But they want to get a shooting method for this. So how do you do this? You do it like this, like Nivergeld. You introduce a decomposition of the time interval into several subintervals, and you pose the problem on each subinterval. So what you do is you introduce uh, <coughs> many subintervals in time. So this is now a time direction. And you, you, you impose the problem on each time interval. And you need to patch them together somehow, these solutions. So how do you patch them together? You say, I don't know where I should start, but I give this a name. So on each interval, I should start at the value capital UN. I don't know what it is, but I just say on this interval I start here, 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 here I start here, and here actually I know where to start on the first one because I have my initial condition. So these are these unknown variables, and they're called shooting parameters. They're not known. So the method tries to determine these values. And how do you determine these values? It's not complicated. You can write an equation for these values. For the first value, it's very easy. The capital U0 is just the initial value of the problem. But then the capital U1, this one you don't know. But you know it must be where the solution, where the solution of the first interval is arriving. So the equation for U1 is linking to U0 via this nonlinear relation. The equation for U2 is linking to U1 via this nonlinear relation, and so on. So whenever this trajectory arrives, that must be where the next trajectory will continue. It's just a set of equations that are written which define what these shooting parameters should be. It's a nonlinear system of equations. It's exactly the matching conditions that you need. If I start at U1, and if I go to the time T2 with my solution of U1, I should be at the shooting parameter T, and so on. So this is a nonlinear system of equations, and suddenly it looks like one has things to solve on each interval, because nonlinear system of equations you solve by iteration, Newton's iteration in particular. So let's write Newton's iteration. So if I collect all these shooting parameters into a vector, then this nonlinear relation become a nonlinear system, f of u equals 0. And this you solve with a Newton. You find all shooting parameters simultaneously. 
Uh, Newton's method is very easy. For a nonlinear function, f of u is 0. You get the new shooting parameter. k is now the iteration step. step. You get the old shooting parameter minus the Jacobian matrix inverse applied to f of uk. That's just Newton's method written on this. And you can see this Newton's method can run in parallel. I just need to evaluate the Jacobian. I do it for all shooting parameters. And I get a new shooting value for all of those as a function of the old shooting parameter of all of those. So it seems miraculous. I suddenly calculate this whole trajectory at once with Newton's method. And even better, you know, Newton's method converges quadratically. If you're close to the solution, this will converge quadratically everywhere to the solution. So it converges in the future and in the past and in between at the same rate. It looks like a miracle. So what iteration is this really? Because uh, you know th this nonlinear system here I is a very particular nonlinear system. The first equation here only depends on u zero. The next equation depends on u zero and u one. This depends on u one and u two. So the Jacobi matrix here is a very special matrix. If I take a derivative with respect to the variable on the diagonal just have the identity every time. So on the diagonal, I have the identity every time. And below the diagonal, I have a derivative of the trajectory with respect to its initial condition. So the structure of this Jacobi matrix is like this. I have an identity on the diagonal, and here I have a derivative of the trajectory. So if I write my Newton method again, it looks like this. The first shooting parameter at every Newton iteration is the same. It's just the initial condition. And that makes a lot of sense. I should not change that one because that one is correct. So Newton's method doesn't change that one. But then the next shooting parameter, it needs to solve the problem, starting at the previous shooting parameter. And then there is the Jacobian update from the Jacobi matrix to the difference of two iterators. So this is Newton's method. Or if I write this in more general, this is Newton's method. So n here is where I am in time, and k here is where the Newton method iterates. So this is Newton's method. <coughs> and as I mentioned, you can prove quadratic convergence if you're close enough to the solution. So this solves in the future with a, a same fast rate than everywhere in the past. It's just contractual identity. Looks like a miracle. Not very practical because you have to calculate the Jacobian. <laughs> and if it's a PD, it's an infinite dimensional Jacobian you have to calculate. So I've implemented this three weeks ago for the first time. You can get it to work. It's, it's quite a mess, but you can get it to work, and it does converge quadratically. But there is a much more clever idea that gives a much better algorithm. And that's this parallel algorithm. That's the one that launched the whole research field again by Leon Smade and Turinici, like I mentioned. I describe it as well for the same problem that I describe now, this multiple shooting method. It needs two ingredients. It needs a G, which is a solver of this problem, which must be G. It's called a coarse solver, G. G is for coarse because G stands for Grossier in French, that he invented in French. And it also works in German. Grober integrator. You look up for a coarse, coarse integrator. And what it does is it takes some value at the of the solution at some time t1 and it gives you an approximate solution at time t2. And it's very cheap. For example, one of the slide to use that. And then you have a very expensive one. This is very accurate. It also takes some initial value at some time t1 and it gives you a very accurate solution at time t2. This could even be the exact solution. Conceptually, it can't be exact, but it's arbitrarily expensive. And as for Nivergeld, in this algorithm, you have to partition the domain and time into subintervals, and then you do this iteration. That's the parallel iteration. So, what is this iteration? It starts at this value, always with the initial condition. That makes a lot of sense. It's like Newton's method before. So, the initial, now I call it almost shooting parameter, is always this value. And this value here at the time n plus 1, at iteration k plus 1 of this parallel algorithm, it requires 
a very accurate solve, and then it takes a difference of two coarse solves. One is for the previous iteration, and one is for the new iteration, k and k plus one. That's just a formula I can implement very easily. And it can work with this as well. So what, what algorithm is this? That's the algorithm that was published in this paper in 2001, not in this form. And it was not visible what it is. But now we can sort of see what it is, this algorithm. Because I've shown you the multiple shooting iteration before. This is the multiple shooting iteration. So the first line is identical. And this line here is almost the same as well. Here we have the exact solution on each interval. In parallel, you have f, which is the fine solution, which you can consider as being the exact solution. And here you have a Jacobian term, derivative times difference. And these two are exactly the same arguments that appear in the parallel algorithm as a difference of the course problem. So parallel is nothing else than a multiple shooting method, but instead of calculating the Jacobian, you approximate the Jacobian by a difference, which you often do, and this difference you calculate on a coarse mesh, so it's cheap. That's the parallel algorithm, it's a multiple shooting algorithm. And this took, took quite a while to see this. Once you have this, you can prove convergence results. One result is that this algorithm converges in a finite number of steps. It never fails, but every iteration gives you one more interval exactly. So the first iteration you can see because it starts correctly, it gives you the first value correctly. And then by induction, once this one is correct, you get this one correct in the next iteration, this one correct, this one correct, this one correct, this one correct. And that's a property I saw when I read the original paper and I thought this is of no interest. Because if you want to get the trajectory, if you have seven processors and you have to do seven iterations, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, you've lost the whole speed up. You've calculated seven times the nonsense. And that's the property I saw from the first publication. But then there is also this result, which I've illustrated just before, that this parallel is actually a multiple shooting method. So it's an approximate Newton's method. So maybe it does much better than just to converge in a finite number of steps. And it actually does. And there is a very accurate convergence result, which I obtained with Ernst Heyer. And it shows that because it's an approximate Newton's method, you don't get quadratic convergence. You lose quadratic convergence. But you're better than linear. You get a superlinear rate. I think I will not explain the formulas in detail, but I just want to mention that superlinear rate comes from this k plus 1 factorial here. If you divide by a k factorial, this becomes large faster than any other quantity to the power k. So eventually this algorithm will go faster than any linear convergence. So it's between a linear iteration and Newton's method. It also, this result also contains the finite step convergence here, and it also contains the result that Yvon Made and Gabriel Kurunitsky and Leon proved. You can consider this as a method that if you have your course method as Euler's method, which is a first order method. After one iteration, you have a second order method. After two iterations, you have a third order method. So you can just say I do five parallel steps. And if I use a method of order p, then the result is going to be order 5p. It's a different way of looking at this algorithm. But I like this one more because I'm an iterative person. I, I, I see this as an approximate Newton's method. So I show you how this works for Lorentz's equation. That's what Ekman said I should do. So here is Lorentz's equation with the same solution I've shown you before, same starting value. And in the blue dot, this is the parallel approximation, and it's the first one. So it's just the core solver. And you see, it's, it's pretty much wrong. If you, if you complete it in the wrong, wrong butterfly, it just goes anywhere. And now I run this parallel iteration, which is very cheap, because my core solver costs nothing here. And uh, it tries to converge to the butterfly. And it's an approximate Newton's method. So it really tries. And I've told you this is a hard problem. This is chaotic. And you see, it, it, it suffers. But, but it's very, very good already everywhere here. It's very, very good. But, but this little, little wiggle here really bombed it off because it's a hard system. But eventually, it abandons. It really contracts uniformly everywhere. And this is the contraction rate. This is the iteration number. 
you put 10 to the minus 15, this is the error. And you saw initially for the first few steps it struggled, but then it contracted and faster than linear. It's, it's, it's super linear, faster than linear. So that's what this parallel algorithm does. And if we look at this example, I used 500 course time intervals, which means I could have used 500 processors to run it. So each iteration I would have used 500 processors in parallel. And I needed eight iterations to get to an accuracy which is a, a reasonable accuracy for this system. You can only get in this length of about 10 to the minus one accuracy, otherwise you need quadruple precision to go further. And so I could have one, maybe a 60 speed up with 500 processors. I would have wanted 500 speed up if I waste 500 processors. But for parallelization in time in general, that's not possible. There are very few algorithms and very few problems where you really get the full bang for the buck. But if this is weather prediction, if I can do this 60 times faster, I can calculate the prediction for tomorrow, today. And if I don't do this, my prediction is going to come the day after tomorrow, for tomorrow is too late. And that's often the case in these time parallel settings, and that's why they call this algorithm parareal. This is parallel computation for real-time problems. So you see, if you have many processes available, you just use them. You maybe waste some, but you're faster in more problems. And that was a dream of Nirgal. You have many, many processes you don't know what to do. Just, just use them. Just calculate. Just calculate. Do redundant calculations. That's the parallel algorithm. <coughs> How does parallel work for a heat equation? was the other model problem I had. So here is a heat equation. I think I have an implementation of this as well, so we can actually look. So here I took a heat equation that, that does not really behave like a heat equation it's supposed to. Because you see, this, this solution, uh, this is like space, and this is like time, and the solution oscillates. I've shown you before, a heat equation usually does not oscillate. You know, the nail is just cooling down, it's not oscillating. So here I have to put a heater which heats, and then cools, and then heats, and then cools, and then heats, and then cools. Uh, and if you do enough heating, enough cooling, then, then it really oscillates the heat equation solution. And this is to show you why it works. So I have a source which is really, heating, cooling, heating, cooling, and the solution looks like this, and I try to calculate this with the parallel algorithm. So I just run the parallel formula. Oh, I did uh, one too much, but it's, it's not too bad, one can still see everything. So here is the approximation I get after iteration three. Maybe I should just start it again because three iterations is quite a lot. So this is iteration one. So iteration one, you see, this already looks like it's heating and cooling approximately correctly. And if we look at the error, you see it's still wrong. It's, it's, it's still of the order of the solution, the error. But you see something important. The first interval is correct. This we know now because the analysis said the first interval in the first iteration is correct. So the error here is zero. But you also see the error in between is really small. And so if I continue iterating on this, See the error contracts now it's point 0.1, point zero 0.01, 10 to the minus 3. And you can nicely see it converges from the initial condition, but it really contracts uniformly. It, it goes down over the whole. We calculate the future here in parallel. 10 to the 4, 10 to the minus 5, 10 to the minus 6, 10 to the minus 7. It's a very, very fast contraction rate. 10 to the minus 8. So now we have the first half exactly. So there is still speed up here, but we've wasted now uh, a lot of calculation, but this too would never have had an accuracy of 10 to the minus 7. We could have stopped before. It's just to see how it behaves. It contracts. And eventually it's finite step convergence. There is no error left at the end. And in this case, you see the convergence is linear. The initial convergence is linear. And then it transits to a super linear regime, which you don't see here because it's very slow. This is the error. Now, if 
why does that work so well for this situation? What I did is I just turned the error plot slightly. So you still have time. Time goes from here to here. Place goes from here to here. And now we look very carefully why that works. You see, the initial interval has converged, which we know from this argument here. But we see in each interval, because this is a diffusive problem, an error which still is at the initial line of each interval is just damped out by the heat equation because it's a diffusive process. So even in the future here, if the error is as big as this, it's decaying very rapidly and it is a very small error to the next interval. Or in other words, the heat equation is a time-dependent equation that somehow forgets what had happened before. So you can calculate the future without knowing what had happened before. You need to know a little. You need to, load, you need to know the low frequency. But all high frequencies die, like in the smoother of the multigrid map. So for a parabolic problem, this algorithm calculates perfectly in parallel in time. And it calculates the future here without knowing where this is coming from because this information dies in the problem. It's not making it over long time. So this problem, parallel, works extremely well. What happens for a transport equation? Here is a transport equation. So I have the x direction here. I have the time direction here. I start with some initial sine wave. And it solves the transport equation. Now you remember the transport equation just transports from the left to the right. And so what I need to do is to get something interesting. I have periodic conditions, so my solution goes out at this end, and it comes back in here, goes through the domain, comes back in here, it goes through the domain, it comes back in here, and so on. So the solution here at the end of the time interval depends on the solution here. If I don't have periodic conditions, then the solution here does not depend on the initial condition, and then it is very easy to solve in parallel. I don't know what to use. So the first iteration, you see, this is not real. This is the first part of real iteration. There's nothing of the information the solution has here is arriving here. Also, the next iteration is not very good. And also, the following iteration is not very good. This is not like the heat equation. Nothing goes up here. Everything that arrives here comes from here. And it needs to propagate through all these interests. It's a hyperbolic problem. Hyperbolic problems don't forget anything. Parabolic problems forget everything. And so there's no way to get this algorithm to work correctly. If we look at the error in these iterations, the error is of the size of the solution. It's 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 just not the right method. You cannot solve a hyperbolic problem with this technique. It's not the right technique. And if you look from the side like I did before, you can see the reason why it doesn't work is there is no <coughs> decay here in the error. There is no decay that parallel can use. And so parallel just stagnates, 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 and it only converges once you reach the propagation through and when it relates to the component. So for hyperbolic problems, that's not the right algorithm. This will not work. There are, in the literature, papers that show that you can make it work. And the way to make it work in the first paper is you use a numerical scheme that has so much diffusion that you're solving a heat equation <laughs> instead of a transport equation. And then suddenly it works. It has to, because now it's a heat equation. And then there is an interesting approach where they try to do a dispersion correction. The dispersion correction is the right thing to try to make it work. I tried it for Helmholtz problems with dispersion correction, but it's fundamentally the wrong algorithm. You cannot really make it work. You cannot really make it work. It's not the right thing. So maybe this is the right moment to have a break. <laughs> okay, so we have three more techniques go to go through. So it's a lo lot more coming. The next uh, methods are the red methods. These are the wave formalization methods, or wave formalization and domain decomposition. 
So he started with uh, Picard and Lindelof, which is an existence theorem, then a very practical mm -hmm. algorithm, and then methods for PD. And I want to explain again the, the very different nature of these algorithms, but the time parallel nature for solving. So the typical decomposition here is in the other direction. You remember for shooting methods, we cut in this way. For waveform relaxation methods, we cut the domain in this way. So it's decomposition in space, not in time, for these methods. These methods come from the Picard iteration. Picard, at the time he was uh, working, was interested in existence and uniqueness of solution. And at that time, one did not even know if these ordinary differential equations have solutions these nonlinear ordinary differential equations. So he posed an equation like this. We've seen this equation already many times. Time derivative on the left, nonlinear function f on the right, interested in the solution from zero to capital T. And to prove existence, what Picard did, he just integrated this equation in time. If you integrate this equation in time, then here on the left, it's a derivative you integrate. You get the value at the top of the integral minus the value at the bottom, which you put on the right. And then on the right-hand side, you just integrate this function. And so you basically left with the integral of the function. So this is just a different way of writing the same problem. We have u of t is u at 0, which is the initial value, plus the integral of this function. So these two formulations are equivalent. It's equivalent to say that you have a solution to this one, to say you have a solution to this one. And what Picard did, looking at this equation, he said it's too hard to solve if the unknown u is here and here at the same time. It's just too hard. So let's introduce an iteration. Let's start with some guess for the solution here and put it here and then calculate the new approximation here. So for example, you can start here with the same value as you have at zero, and just assume your initial guess for the solution is uh, constant in time. Then you put it here, you integrate, you add u zero, and you find a new approximation. And then you put this approximation here, you integrate, and it goes through. And integration was easier than solving ordinary differential equations back then. That's the Picard iteration. And in the Picard paper, there's a proof of convergence of this, but no estimate of how fast it contracts. It's a very abstract proof. But he proves that this contracts, and this contracts to a function u, which satisfies this equation. And with this, he proves that there is a solution to this equation, and it's unique. And then it was uh, Lindelof, just a year later, who proved a uh, contraction speed of this method, or the contraction rate. And what he needs to assume is that the right-hand side function is a Lipschitz function, which is evaluated at two different arguments, g and w. And this is less than a Lipschitz constant times the difference of these values. So if the right-hand side function has this property, and if you do this Picard iteration, after k iteration steps, your approximation after k steps is close to the exact solution if we take the maximum error in time, like this. So it's the distance that of your initial guess to the solution, and then times L times T to the K divided by K factorial. So now L is the Lipschitz constant, T is the interval in which you're interested in the solution, and K is the iteration index. So you have a constant to the power K divided by K factorial. Now remember, this k factorial is growing faster than any constant to the k. It's actually the same k factorial we've seen in the parallel algorithm. This converges like the parallel algorithm. So it's some constant to the k divided by k factorial. So it's faster than linear. It's a superlinear convergence rate. That was proved by Lindelof in 1894. The paper by Picard is 1893, just a year before. So this is a method that converges. Now, this method was investigated in the 50s by Milner, and he said this is really a pointless method. It's converging so slowly, there is no practical use of this method whatsoever. But the engineers at IBM didn't know about this. <laughs> and 
So in 82, it was Albert really who's a Swiss, who is still alive. He's like 88 now, I think. And uh, I'm still in contact with him because uh, he emigrated to the US uh, when he was like 25 years old. And I met him when he was like over 60. And I immediately started to babble Swiss German to him because I knew he was from Zurich. And then from deep down under, he answered in Swiss German. He had not spoken Swiss German in like 50 years or something. And we always speak Swiss German. <laughs> That's amazing. He is also a ski racer. And he was racing with the uh, very old <laughs> people at the age of 82 or so. And he fell. He broke his hip. And now he's really sad that he cannot race anymore. But he's still good spirit. And uh, he, at eight, in 82, at IBM, he was at, at this generation where the computers, they were growing so rapidly in transistor numbers that IBM could not do a simulation of the next generation processors on the current generation computers because they were too big to store even. They had so many more transistors, they could not even store them on the current computer. So he had to find a method to simulate chips which were too large. And that's what he said here. The waveform relaxation method is an iterative method for analyzing nonlinear dynamical systems in the time domain. The method at each iteration decomposes the system into several dynamical subsystems, each of which is analyzed for the entirety of the time interval. So you see, this is exactly this idea. You decompose your problem in space, and then you solve each problem in time, and then you do something. You convert it into this kind of thing. <coughs> and so what's this algorithm? Here is an original example from that paper. It's a MOS ring oscillator. Who is doing circuits among you? Come on, nobody ever does anything <laughs> in this audience. So this is an electric circuit. This is a MOS ring oscillator. Why is this a MOS ring? Why does it oscillate? To see why it oscillates, it's best just to do a thought experiment. So, so, so assume this, this, uh, this voltage here, which is connected to this source voltage, is initially at 5 volts, because I somehow pump in 5 volts here. So if this is at 5 volts, then you have 5 volts, which goes to the gate of this transistor. A transistor opens if you put voltage to the gate. So this means this is now open. So this connects this voltage to the ground. So if I have 5 volts coming in here, then this is pulled down to 0 because it's connected to the ground because this is open. So then I have 0 volts here, then I have 0 volts at this gate. Now 0 volts means this transistor is closed. But because this is closed, now this is pulled up to 5 volts. So we have 5 volts at this node. And now you see you get this 5 volts fed back to this transistor. So this means this transistor opens. And this, which was at 5 volts, is now connected to ground. So it's going down to 0 because it's connected to ground. So this means we have a 0 now, which means this one is pulled up to 5 volts. And then this one opens. It goes down to ground. So we have ground here. So this one closes. This one goes up. That's why it's oscillating. That's a mastering oscillator. And you need an odd number. Otherwise, it's not oscillating. If you have an even number, it's going to stay need an odd number so that it changes all the time. So this can be uh, written as a system of ODEs using the Kirchhoff and Ohm laws. This is that Kirchhoff and Ohm laws at each of these nodes. And you get a system of ODEs, which is written here in a general form. So every node depends on the other node. And there is a function here that says how it depends on the other node. And now in, at IBM, if this system had been too big, it's not too big for this book to illustrate, you have to partition it into smaller systems, and you have to have a method that solves just smaller systems. What they do is they chop the wires here and here. So now we have three systems, and the wires have been cut. So if the wires are cut, you cannot simulate this system anymore because you don't know what's coming in along these two cables that were cut. This was the feedback cable, and this is the cable that goes to the next one. So you just assume that you know the value from a previous iteration. That's why it's relaxation. So you have here a value now which you assume you know. And if you know these two values, then you can calculate this. And if you know these two values, you can calculate this. If you know these two values, you can calculate this. So you introduce an iteration. Assume you know the V0s, so you can calculate V1s. And assume that we know the V1s, we give them to the coupling cables, we can calculate V2, and we can iterate. That's waveform relaxation. 
And if I write this for the system, it, it's very easy. You have a new value at iteration k, which is a new value, and it just takes the old values for the other arguments. And every equation does this. And you can even see it looks like a Jacobi iteration because the diagonal is new and the octagonals are old. But it's a Jacobi iteration for an OD system, not for a linear algebra system. So that's a wave formalization method. You need some initial guess for what the waveforms are, the solutions are. You feed them in, you solve, you feed them in, you solve. And in this case, there is a solution plot for the first voltage after one, two, three, four iterations. And so in the first iteration, the voltage is just going from zero to five volts. But you remember that the, the whole feedback is missing now because I cut the wires. So it just stays at five volts. In the first iteration, it cannot see the feedback through the loop. But in the second iteration, it sees the first feedback coming, but not the other ones. And then in the third iteration, you see the next feedback coming, and in the fourth iteration, basically, we're converged because we're not interested in the signal later. Later, it will be missing. You have to continue iterations to get the other one. That's how wave formalization converges for this multiple oscillator. And that's what they already say. Note that since the oscillator is highly non-unidirectional due to the feedback from V3 to the NOR gate, the convergence of the iterated solution is achieved with the number of iterations being proportional to the number of oscillating cycles of interest. This we'll see later as well in this algorithm. This is a typical behavior for this algorithm if the system has some hyperbolic nature. Because you see, it is like, it's like a transport system. It's like a hyperbolic system. So there is a general result on wave form relaxation, and that's the second problem I had when I taught this class for the first time in 2018. I knew there is a result like this when I was preparing my class, like in the other case the night before. And I just wanted to get these results from the literature, so I started searching. And I found one guy said this is a, a very well-known result, but didn't give it. And another guy said the convergence is, is, is like the PCAR iteration without this factor. And for the proof, see an Olavi paper. And the Olavi paper had the proof also without this, but just for linear problems. And then uh, <coughs> the, there was a book that said it's trivial to show. And then it was Bellin and Zanaro who said, who gave this result and said it's easy to prove, but didn't give the proof. It was such a nightmare. So eventually, I actually did the proof. It took me about six or seven pages. I went through an hour of courses in between. And it was too complicated, the proof. You can't do it simply. It, it's not trivial. In Chrome level MI, it, it, it is work. And in the book that I'm writing about this, there is now a, a proof which is complete and it's, it's given. And it also converges like the PCAR iteration. You see, it's exactly the same factor. You have this constant, except it's only the Lipschitz constant of the splitting function with respect to the second argument. Because now you need a splitting function somewhere at k and somewhere at k minus 1. So you need a splitting function. And so the first Lipschitz constant appears, the second Lipschitz constant appears here, like in the PCAR iteration. And the first one has some exponential growth in time, but it's just a constant. There's no iteration attached to it. So it converges like the PCAR iteration. So unfortunately, it is as bad as the PCAR iteration. So they invented it, but it's not a good method. So Milner was basically right when he said it's not a computational method. But, but if you choose P not to be large, which means if you simulate on, on small time windows, then it contracts quite well. Because then even here you get a geometric contraction. If LP times P is less than 1, you get less than 1 to the K. But if you have long time windows, and we want to calculate long in the future, then it does not contract well. So let's look at Schwartz waveform relaxation. That's now for a PD. So to do what we did for the circuit for a PD, we can take a heat equation. This is the one-dimensional heat equation we've seen many times now. This is the cooling nail should have a boundary condition on the left and on the right. And now we want to use the Schwartz method. So we do a decomposition of the domain into two subdomains, like in the Schwartz method. It's a decomposition in space, not in time. And then we just solve the heat equation on the left domain. And we solve the heat equation on the right domain. And that the interfaces, these domains overlap from alpha to beta, 
we use what the other subdomain calculated at the previous iteration. This is exactly the same method as for the circuit where we chop wires, but we chop the domain, the interval from 0 to L into overlapping domains. So this is exactly the same algorithm, but it's written for a PD. <coughs> so how does this work? I take again a heat equation. I take again the heating and cooling. That's actually how I generated this heating and cooling profile. So it's like heat and cool and heat and cool. And I take two different time intervals. I take a long one up to t equal five, and I take a short one up to t equal zero one, because the algorithm behaves differently on long and short intervals. It doesn't have the same effect. So here you see the long interval with many heating and cooling. And here on the short interval, you just see the start of the first heating, and then it stops. So it's just starting to heat here. And now I let this algorithm run. This algorithm solves on the left subdomain, so this subdomain here, then it solves on the right, it solves on the left, and it just iterates. So here is the first iteration on the long interval. And I start with zero, because I don't know what the solution looks like. And you see on the left subdomain, it's sort of heat, cool, heat, cool. And on the right subdomain, it's heat, cool, heat, cool. But in the middle, it's wrong because, because my, my values are not good yet. But I can iterate. And so if I iterate, you'll see this method just converts. And you can actually see it converges over all time. You see it, con it converges here and here. It, 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 it somehow uniformly contracts space-time. And this is the error. So it's the difference between the solution and the input. And you see the error goes down uniformly in time. So this was for a long time interval. Now I look at a short time interval. So the first iteration, now you just see the first heating phase. And it's also wrong in the middle because I start with zero. And now here you see there's something else that happens that we didn't see in the long phase. If you look at this, area here. That's gone too fast. You, you can see there is something like in parallel. It's sort of, it's, it's pretty good at the beginning. So it also contracts here, but it somehow, there is something coming from the initial line. And if you look at the error, this is the error in this iteration. You see it's definitely pushing from the initial line. See how it pushes forward? So this, this algorithm has two convergence mechanisms. One is this forward push, and the other one is a uniform contraction. And I was working on this in my thesis, and I proved these two convergence results. So it has a linear convergence rate. It's a linear estimate. So if you are on a long time interval, you contract linearly. And if you're on a short interval, you contract super linearly. I will give the rates in formula. So this is the linear convergence estimate. So the error, the initial error and the error at iteration 2k are linked by a constant which is smaller than 1 to the power k. And you can also show that if you are on a short time interval, then the error initially is linked to the error after 2k steps by an error function complement which contracts super linearly. So it has both properties from the Schwartz method at the steady state and from this waveform relaxation method. But it's not a factorial here. It's an error function complement. And this comes out of the heat kernel. The heat kernel does something else than this waveform relaxation generic estimate. And if you compare these two estimates, so here is the estimate for waveform relaxation in general. This would be a constant with k divided by k factorial. If I expand this for k large, which is the iteration number, then I get some complicated expression times exponential of minus k log k. And if I expand the error function complement, then I get also an expression here, and I get exponential of minus k squared. So for the heat equation, this contracts faster than other waveform relaxation methods, because this is only k log k. This is k squared, and there is a minus sign squared. So this, this algorithm benefits from the heat equation nature of the problem. So for diffusive problems, this contracts well. <coughs> the 
these calculations can either do it or do the calculating or you can simply ask Maple if he's interested. That's just his expansion. I've been using Maple so much lately because I always get him wrong. <coughs> we can do it for a wave equation. Different PD. Same algorithm. I have now a wave equation. I have two subdomains. I solve the wave equation on the left. I solve the wave equation on the right. I exchange values and I solve values, solve values, solve. And just look what happens. So here is the solution of a wave equation where I put now the same heating and cooling that I had in the heat equation. But you see, it looks very different because that's now not a heat equation, it's a wave equation. But it's the same source. And so it just produces this as a solution. This is the heat and cool like I did it in the heat equation. That's how the solution looks like. I would just solve the first iteration. So you see it produces two bumps. It goes here. Then I do the next iteration. Then I do the next iteration. Next iteration. Let's look at the error. First iteration. Now you see clearly how it pushes out the error. You see? This really looks like parallel, but parallel doesn't work for the wave equation. But here it sort of does something. So for the wave equation, you can prove convergence is again very different. For a wave equation, you converge in a finite number of steps. This is like in Albert Riley's example of the MOS ring oscillator. You need a certain number of steps to get to the solution. The number of steps is related to the interval you're interested in, to the wave speed, and to the overlap time. It's a direct solver. But it's a direct solver that, sto that sto stops not too late. For parallel, it stops too late. This wave equation stops much earlier, so it gets parallel speed up for the wave equation. I have a version of this algorithm now which is teaching the best uh, times parallel method, which is based on temp pitching from uh, Vienna. And it basically emulates a, 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 an algorithm that they do in Vienna that's implemented in a more complicated way, temp pitching. So this, this, this is a good algorithm for hyperbolic hops. It can parallelize nicely. You have to organize your computations well. But this is a good algorithm. Now, I told you these are all slow, these methods. So how can you make them faster? And this is a topic that I discussed this morning in the context of fluid structure interaction as well. So this is now a fluid structure algorithm, except that I have neither a fluid nor a structure. I have just two heat equations. So I have a heat equation in one subdomain, a heat equation in the other subdomain. I use this algorithm, but I want to make it faster. I want to make it contract faster. So I use the algorithm like before. I solve a heat equation in the first subdomain. I solve a heat equation in the second subdomain. But instead of just giving values to the neighbor, I give a combination of a value and a normal derivative to the neighbor. This is as cheap as giving the value. I just need to calculate the derivative of mod. And if I choose this p well, I can get a very fast algorithm. And that's also true for fluid structure interaction. There's a whole theory behind this. I can just show you how it works. This is the first iteration on the long time interval. You remember the first iteration before it had two bumps. Here, the first iteration, you barely see that it's not gluing correctly. And the computational cost is the same as this. I just calculate two heat equation solutions in parallel. And it's almost glued perfectly with a good choice of P. This is the sec second iteration, third iteration, fourth iteration. This is the error, how it contracts. And if you compare to the classical method, here I have iterations, here I have the error, and this is the classical force weight normalization method, and this is the optimized one. You get a much, much better performance. And this can be done for fluid structure interaction as well. It can be done for any problem which you solve in space-time, which is decomposed. There is a mathematical theory behind it to understand what these good choices are and to develop them. We've developed them for many, many equations, for Maxwell's equations, for advection reaction diffusion, for shallow <coughs> water, for many equations we know what the parameters are. These you can use without overlap, which is important for fluid structure interaction. You cannot overlap if it's fluid structure. It doesn't make any sense. You have a fluid and structure which is separate. These methods work. And also much faster, this is first iteration without overlap, second iteration without overlap, third iteration without overlap. They're very fast, very, very fast. This is how the error contracts. 
And here is an example where I do now an advection reaction diffusion equation on eight subdomains. So this is basically eight subdomains. Oh, eight subdomains. Here you see the overlap. So a small overlap. And in red I show the exact solution. And you remember that's that's a solution that will transport. It doesn't have the transport term, but it also has diffusion because I added all the other terms. And so the exact solution is that time is going this way. You see the exact solution goes to the right and it goes down. And on this we have a classical Schwartz wave formalization here. And here we have an optimized Schwartz wave formalization algorithm. And the blue dashed line is the approximate solution. And it's at the first iteration. So I was on, uh, only calculating each subdomain once. And you see with the classical solution, because I don't know what the solution is here, I put the zero guess, we lose a lot of the signal. Whereas with the optimized transmission conditions, the signal is sort of still here. By miracle imposing zero with these other conditions, it sort of knows that the solution is here. And on the next transparency, I just have one more. So you see, this is a very, very good approximation at the first iteration when I put zero, everything is lost. So optimizing transmission conditions is a good thing for these algorithms. You gain a lot and you pay nothing. So I get to the third method, which are multigrain methods. These are the blue methods. And I want to explain the idea of Huck Bush, show you his method, and show you why it's not working, and show you what we understood with Martin Neumüller to make it work. This is basically the best method I, I know so far for parabolic problems in the time parallelization system. So this is Hawk Push in 1984. Parabolic multigrid method, he called it. So you can clearly see it's for a parabolic problem. It's a multigrid method. And he said a multigrid iteration for solving parabolic partial differential equations for them. It is characterized by the simultaneous computation of several time steps in one step of the computation path. So he really says that now we iterate over many time steps in the method. We don't do time stepping. We just do over many steps. So if I write his method for a heat equation, this is the Ken hour nail between two ice cubes. We do a discretization with a backward Euler scheme. So we discretize with backward Euler. We also discretize in base the Laplace operator in one dimension. This is just a minus 2, 1, 1 matrix we've seen earlier. So it's the matrix I just and what is this process that Hackbush does? It's the following. The conventional approach is to solve time step by time step. U n plus 1 is computed from U n. Then U n plus 2 is computed from U n plus 1, etc. The following process will be different. Assume that U n is already computed or given as an initial state. Simultaneously, we shall solve for U n plus 1, U n plus 2, U n plus 10 in one step of the algorithm. That's exactly what we want to do. Many time steps all at once, all at once. So this is this time stepping method. This is what I had before, the discretization with backward Euler here. So I just put everything that's n plus one on the left, everything that's n on the right. So you see everything related to n plus one on the left, this is a matrix. Everything that's related to n on the right, this is a vector. This is all known. This is unknown. This is all known. I have to solve a system A u n plus 1 equals D. Now if I want to do multigrid, you remember I have to partition A into a lower diagonal and upper part and get some smoothing iteration like Jacobi. So I do some smoothing iteration. Damp Jacobi for this system. This is just a new iteration. This is the old iteration plus my damping parameters times the diagonal inverse, times the residual. That's exactly the damn Jacobi I had before. But now we can look at what it is, because I know what B is in my situation, and I also know what A is in my situation. <coughs> so I plug them in. So B, B is this quantity. A is this quantity, so I copy B and A. And now my, my, my B here, it needs to take the value I had before. So if I had calculated this normally, this would be an approximation from the previous time step. So I put a new 
I'm saying I have done new times, new smoothing iterations on it. And so I get this iteration. This is the Jacobi stamp, Jacobi iteration. So then Hockbush makes an interesting comment. He says that we, we should, uh, we, we can use this sequential Jacobi procedure in space time, but we should consider two situations. One where we do coarsening in space. So you see here every every second line of grid points disappears in space. But he does not coarsen in time. And in multiverse usually you coarsen in all directions because you want to have a smaller problem. But he doesn't do it and he gets very fast convergence when he coarsens in space. And then he makes a comment that it sort of doesn't work when you coarsen in time at all. So this is a multigrid method where you can only coarsen in space. You somehow cannot coarsen in time. And so I, I, I show you, I implemented this. There is a version of this method where you even say continuous in time. If you say continuous in time, time there's not even a grid, so you cannot coarsen in time. And they get this is loops and awesome, and they get a very sharp convergence estimate for this method at the continuous level. And they even say that if they discretize time now, that it would be Hockbusch's method. But what's, what's the problem with this method? So let's look at it. I implemented the method, and so I do first five free smoothing steps. And this is a heat equation from 0 to 1, and here it's from 0 to 6 in time. And you see the signal after five smoothing steps. I start with a random initial data. It looks sort of smooth. This is the error. So now we do a coarse correction. And you saw this, you need to look at the scale. The scale goes from 1 to 0 0.05. So this course correction is extremely effective. This error has diminished tremendously, but it has become a much more oscillatory again. So you have to do again smoothing steps, so you do smoothing. You do again a course correction. Now we are at uh, 0 0.1. And then we continue. After the course correction, we are at 10 to the minus 3. We do again smoothing, post smoothing again pre smooth it well, and so far. So I get a reduction to 10 to the minus 4 in uh, three two grid iterations. That method works. So the error goes down very fast. But now I do space time course correction. That's what Hockbush says is, is the magic one. And if you look at it, it's a disaster. So here I do space time coarsening. The first smoothing looks the same. Now I do the course correction. And it only went down to before it went down by a factor 10. But it still did slow down a little. So I do post smoothing. Then I do, <laughs> it, it looks smooth. I do pre smoothing. You see, it, lo it looks rather smooth. I mean, it, it oscillates much less. And then I do a next course correction, 0.4. This is not disaster. Then I do again post smoothing, pre smoothing. If you look at these two methods as a function of iteration, this is if you just do semi coarsening in space, you get a very, very good method. The contraction is very fast. You get 10 to the minus 15 in about 8 or 9 iterations. If you do space time coarsening, it's just not working. So this method has a fundamental flaw. It's not yet a good multigrid method. You cannot use it generically for a parabolic problem. So what's wrong with the space-time coarsening? So if I look at this picture that we've seen before of an iteration two after five post-smoothing steps, it looks like the error is smooth. You see, it's not wiggling like a random function. But if I turn and look from the left, you see in time it did not do any time is still highly oscillatory. That's why when you coarsen now in time, it cannot work. It did not smooth in time. This smoother that Hockbush uses has a fundamental problem. It's the ingredient that does not work in this algorithm. So people tried to fix this. Horton and Van der Waal in 1995, they realized that the fundamental problem is that the time direction is different. So they say the fully discrete EE is strongly an isotropic problem. 
point where smoothing combined with standard portioning is notoriously slow costly for such problems. So they try to do semi portioning in space, which is out of time depending on your natural anisotropy. They have different prolongation operators. They have very specific components. And they get, get the results, numerical results for the one and two dimensional heat equations in both the first and second order discretization for time derivatives prove to convert quickly, although at present the F cycle seems to be necessary to achieve grid independent rates, but they do not quite get multi grid performance from these algorithms. So they try to fix it with multi grid techniques, but they cannot quite get it to get full multi grid performance. So now I would like to show you what's wrong. It's a small change you need to do, and then you get multi-grid performance. And this is what we understood with Martin Neumiller when he had worked on my thesis in Graz. I was visiting there. I gave a talk. He showed me what he's doing. We thought about it. And then we wrote a paper together. Actually, we wrote two papers. The first one just on the Dahlquist equation. The second one on the heat equation. And then the reviewer said, well, you should put those together because it's not worthwhile to two manuscripts. We should have said no. But we did it, we put it together, and now even I don't understand the paper anymore. I wanted to use it for teaching. There's just no way. You cannot understand it. There's too much stuff now. There's too much stuff in that paper. And so I had to redo it from scratch for my course in 2018 because it was not, not understandable. So I show you wh why this is. So, so if we look at this multi-grid method for Darquist equation, now I got rid of the Laplacian equation, no Laplace operator, just the time direction. So if I discretize this with backward Euler, then instead of having the Laplace operator here, just the dog with parameter, it's just the number now. So my matrix is now much simpler. The matrix has no Laplace operator here anymore, it's just the number. And so if I take the Jacobi smoother, it looks exactly like before, except there is no, there is no Laplace operator here anymore. So this is just the Jacobi smoother. So now let, 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 let's look if this works. So this is an initial error. It's highly oscillatory because it took a random number. And now we use this Jacobi, damn Jacobi method. Iteration 1, 2, 4, 8, 16. You see it becomes smooth. And I do it in time. So this does work. So why did it not work before? The reason why it did not work before is if I go back to this Jacobi formula, because I don't have a Laplace operator here, if I do Jacobi, I divide by this number, which is the diagonal. When this was a Laplace operator, Huck Bush did not invert a Laplace operator on the diagonal. He just divided by the diagonal part of the Laplace operator. And that's why this smoother is broken. So you cannot do point smoothing if you have a spatial operator. But if you divide by this entire operator, then the method does work. And that's the invention in the thesis of Martin Neumüller. And so what you need to do, if you put back this Laplace operator here, with Jacobi, you cannot just divide by the diagonal. You must divide by the entire block, like in the Donkey's equation. You can analyze this method. You do a Fourier analysis. You inject a Fourier mode. This is a mode that oscillates in time and oscillates in space. You calculate the contraction factor. This is a calculation. It's not complicated, but it has to be done. And then it can look at how this method contracts, this, this smoothing method. And it depends on, the, it depends on, this, on this alpha parameter, which is the parameter in the smoothing Jacobi system. If you look at this, here is a plot where we have the frequency in time and the frequency in space. And I plot this contraction for different values of alpha for the relaxation parameter, for a quarter, for a half, for three quarters, and almost one. And this gives me these four plots. Now recall for the multi-grid method that I showed at the beginning, it was a good choice. A half was a good choice. Two-thirds was also a good choice. And here I want to know what's a good choice. What damps all frequencies? All high frequencies. So where are the high frequencies? 
the high frequencies in time are close to minus 30 and 30. And the high frequencies in space are also close to minus 30 and 30. So I should be small in a ring around this midpoint. Somehow I need to be small. If I looked from above on these figures, I want to be small. If I, I here have the frequency frequencies in time, and here I have the frequencies in space, then the long frequencies are here in the middle. Here I don't care because the core state should do this. But these are all high frequencies. In the whole ring here I have high frequencies, and on these I should contract well. And I should choose my parameter alpha such that I can contract well on this ring. Now, if you see here, all around, the contraction is about 0.8. So th this is not a good value, a quarter. So I should make it bigger. If I make it bigger to a half, you see, this whole ring has come down. So this is a better choice already. So maybe I should make it even larger. For 0.75, it has come down but only for the parts here. Now these parts are good. But here it's not good. You see here it has gone up now. And these are the time components. So here I've gone too far with 0.75. And with 0.9 it's a catastrophe and time it's not working. So with this I approach the method of hot boost. So there's a choice in this alpha which I can do such that the method works in space and in time. And the optimal choice one can analyze. And these are the two important lemmas in the PhD thesis of Martin Neumilder. And this was a design choice. We decided to make sure that it works in time because we want to absolutely coarsen in time. So the first lemma says the best choice for alpha is a half. Because if we choose a half, then it always works as a good smoother in time. We can always course it in space, in time. And that's what hot push couldn't do. And if we choose a half, then we can also course it in space, provided the condition holds. There's a condition here on the mesh size ratio. And if this condition holds, we, we course it in both. If it doesn't hold, we just course it in time. And in the next step, we can course it in space again, because it goes into the good direction of this condition. So we can always course in space-time. Sometimes we have to drop space. We do always time. And very often we can do space again. And then we get a, a convergent result. And this gives an algorithm which has outstanding performance on a parabolic model. So here is an example where we have many space levels, many time levels. And we run this method. Now, now recall we have to invert a Laplace type operator on each block. But it's not necessary. It's sufficient to just do a recycle in space of a multi-grid method, which is very cheap. So it's not needed to invert. The analysis has been done. Finished. So we get to about eight iterations on average for all these different levels. So the real multi-grid performance. And here is a solution time in seconds for a problem which becomes larger and larger. 2,000 unknowns, 23,000 unknowns, up to 131 million unknowns. And here is the solution time in forward substitution. That's the normal solve. So you just go one step after the other. But each step is done with the best possible multigrid method. So this is the solution time. And here is this multigrid method. And then you think, oh, it's much better. And I think, oh, it's actually not much better. And here you might be disappointed. This is like 9,000 seconds, and this is like 10,000 seconds. So we didn't gain anything. But the spectacular thing is this method is fully parallel. So on one processor, this method is as fast as forward substitution. And so as soon as I start to put more processors, which I show in the next transparency, this thing scales like a charm. So here is a weak experiment on a 3D heat equation. So the cores go from one to 262, this is a calculation that Martin Neumiller did in the supercomputer in the Livermore lab. And so the time steps, the problem will just increase. The 
number of degrees of freedom, they go up to 15 uh, billion. The number of iterations of this method is seven, no, no matter how many are not uh, fixed. And the solution time is just 30 seconds, no, no matter how quick you do it. The, the scaling is, is just outstanding. If you look at forward of the future, there's no chance. There is no chance that the time to score is 30 seconds. So this is a fully parallel method. Multigrid has multigrid performance. And on one process, it's as fast as forest of the future. And it solves on all levels at once. This is a strong scaling experiment. Strong scaling means that you increase the number of cores, and you want to go faster and faster. So here the problem size is the same. Always seven iterations, and the time is cut in half. Half, 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 half. And at this point, there's not enough to calculate anymore for processing. So it takes a bigger problem. 15 billion unknown, seven iterations, and half, 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 half. It's spectacular. This is the best algorithm I know for a parabolic problem. This is very hard to beat. I'm working currently to try to beat it. And the idea is, is not complicated. I can tell you what the idea is. There was a design decision here I showed you. We always want that we can do coarsening in time. So we made sure that this, this bump here is not coming up because if it's too high, we cannot coarsen in time anymore. But maybe that was stupid. Maybe we should benefit from this tremendous smoothing here in space. So occasionally, we should actually sacrifice some time. And we have now a slightly faster one, which I thought would never happen. So there is a slightly better choice of the relaxation. But that's a new result, and probably it's just a curiosity, because it, it is very good for an algorithm like this already. It's very easy to do. There are multigrid variants. Parareal, for example, you can show is a multigrid algorithm. Pita was a parareal variant, which is a multigrid algorithm. Mgrid is a very well-known algorithm that's also just parareal. And if you do with a special relaxation, it becomes a parareal algorithm with overlap. Fast is also such an algorithm. It's well-known. If you see one of these buzzwords, they all go into this multigrid category. But I will not explain them in detail. They're explained in the book in detail. And so we get to the last one. And I'm getting tired as well. <laughs> so what's the time now? We have like five minutes. And I should stop the latest at 6.30, but I should stop at 6.15 because we had a shorter break. Yes. So these are somehow easier to explain because there is no convergence analysis, because they're not iterative. These are just methods that do what you really think is not possible. They just do it somehow. So I will explain a few of them. Maybe I will not explain all of them. They're in the black track here. None of them is iterative. One is becoming iterative now. It's this uh, diagonalization. It's the best one in China at the moment on the big computer they have in China. So the first one is the Mironker Linegar method from 1967. And it's a very clever and very simple idea. And they start again with a quote. They say, it appears at first sight that the sequential nature of the numerical methods do not permit the parallel computation on all of the processes we perform. We say that the front of computation is too narrow to take advantage of more than one process. Let us consider how we might widen the computation front. So you see, same start. They say it's maybe not possible, but let's try. And so they consider an ODE, and they use this uh, y as an unknown, so I use here y as well as an unknown, it's just an ODE, this is initial condition. And here there are two drawings with two methods that they look at. Both are predictive corrector methods. So the first predictive corrector method is this one, we call a predictive approximation at time n plus 1. And to do this you use a corrected value at time n, which is here, the, cor the corrected ones are here predictive ones are up here. So you calculate the predicted value at n plus 1 using the corrected value at n. And then you use f of the corrected value at n. And you use also f at the value n minus, uh, y n minus 1. So you use this value and this value to calculate the prediction. So you have a predicted step. And now you use the corrected value here and the predicted and corrected value, which is this one and this one, to calculate
calculate a new correct advance. And so in this method, they would say the computation front is too narrow because you first need to take those two values to calculate this, and then you can take those two values to calculate this. So this you cannot do at all. And now they propose another method. So it's not the same method, it's another method. They propose this one. So what do you do in this one? In this one, you calculate the predicted value, a predicted value. For this predicted value, you use the corrected value from here. And now you don't use the corrected value from here, but you take the predicted value from before. So it's a different method, different formulation. And then you calculate the new corrected value. And for this, you use the corrected value from before and also the predicted value from here. And now if you look at this, these two you can actually do simultaneously because you have all information you need. If you get this one, you use this two. And to get to this one, you also use these two. So these two you can do in parallel. So if you have a dual core, then you can use one core here, one core here. And, and here you can't do this. So they say the computation front has been widened. Suddenly, the calculation can be performed in parallel. I implemented this method just two weeks ago for the first time because I'm working on this chapter for the book. It works like a charm. It has the same order as this method. It has the same error constant almost. And I catch the run on a dual core. So I'm twice as fast. And then I have general methods like this where you can use two F processes. And so if you have a quad core, you just go with four. And, and it works, or with eight. It is really amazing. This is very clever. You cannot get a million processors going on this. There's no way. But, but two, four, eight, these are good methods. Very, very good methods. And there are similar methods here. This is a block implicit one step method. And in the book of Hira and Wander, they have a whole family of, of these methods as well. So this is a way to do direct time polarization. There, there's no iteration. It, it's just, it, instead of going like this, it goes like this. Very, very clever idea. Then there are boundary value methods. These are really weird methods. So the, the first ones come by from Axelson and Verveer. Hereby, we concentrate on explaining the fundamentals of the method because for initial value problems, the boundary value method seems to be fairly unknown. In the forward step approach, the numerical solution is obtained by stepping through the grid. In this paper, we will tackle the numerical solution in a completely different way. We will consider y dot equals f of xy as a two-point boundary value problem with a given value at the left-hand point and an implicitly defined value by the equation at the right-hand point. So when you read this for the first time, you think like, what? And then you, if you look at this picture, you, you remember I told you for shooting, there is a target. And then we had multiple shooting where we introduced our target. So they also introduce somehow a target. They somehow forget an, in, uh, uh, an initial condition here, and then they introduce a condition here, but they introduce the uh, equation of the condition. So, so this is really hard to understand, so I made a simple example to, to show you wh what it is. So here is a simple example. So I take this y dot equals f of y, and I do uh, an explicit metroid point rule. This is a sense of finite difference. So it goes over two steps. So I have yn plus one, minus yn minus one divided by two h. So you see this is a centered finite difference. And then minus two h, because I multiplied through, f of yn. So this uses thre three nodes, n plus one, n, and n minus one. So it's a two-step method. And I only have one initial condition because it's the first order. So in general, if you want to use such a method, you need to start the method somehow. You need an Euler step to start. And once you have two values, then you can advance with it. And here what they do is they, they don't use an other step, other step to start, but they do something at the end to this. So what, what does that produce? So here would be a normal Euler step to start, y1 minus y0 minus h times f of y minus 0. That would be a normal thing to do. And what they do is they do this at the end point. And so at the end point, it's just like yn minus yn minus 1 minus hf yn is 0. Now they have enough equations, enough unknowns, but it's really weird. 
So they have an end condition and a beginning condition and a two-step scheme. So if I do this for the Dalkus equation, for the Dalkus equation for lambda, then my normal way of doing it would be to start with an Euler step. And then I have here my two-step method. This is lower triangle. I can solve by forward substitution. That's what you usually do. But since they put the condition at the end, the matrix is not triangular anymore. This is now a, a tri-diagonal matrix. You see, this is like a diagonal and then a super diagonal, a sub diagonal. So somehow this feels like this doesn't make much sense. It feels really weird because this was easy to solve with triangle. This is now going to be harder to solve because it's now tri diagonal. But, but you can use a Thomas algorithm, for example, to solve this. The Thomas algorithms are uh, now used for the composition of Gaussian elements. And, and for tri diagonal, it's the class of linear complexity. So, so I wanted to know what, what these methods do. It's definitely a different method because I don't impose the same condition. It gives a different solution. And it's really funny. They, they're really different. They don't behave like what you would expect. So if you do for the Dahlquist equation with a negative lambda, with a negative lambda, then the normal scheme that you would do, so th the exact solution decays exponentially because lambda is negative. But the normal scheme that I showed with Euler is actually not, not happy with this problem. Starts oscillating. The boundary value method is very good. The green solution is very close to the exact solution. A and this remains. So even if I refine the mesh, this, this normal way to do Euler and this centered scheme is not, this is well known. But the fact that the boundary value method is good is what is surprised to me. I didn't, didn't know about this. So for decaying solutions, the boundary value method here is a good scheme. And the uh, normal way of doing it is not so good. If I have a growing solution, it's the other way around. For the growing solution, my, my normal scheme is very good. Co the blue one is, is close to the solution. But now the boundary line method is unhappy. It, 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 it cannot go there. And even if I put a very fine mesh into it, it, it will converge into consistent metal, but it, it has a hard time. So boundary valley method, even though they have been studied very carefully, they're good papers, good analysis, one has to be aware these are really different methods. <laughs> you, you, if you want to use this, you, you have to be aware. You have a new method. You have different stability properties. You have to analyze. You have to prove convergence, stability, and everything. And then you have to have a parallel solver. So these are a bit weird. But there is a body of literature on those. Then there is Womble. Womble is one of the first one who proved, who showed speed up for time parallelization. So it is a real achievement. achievement. And what he says is parabolic and hyperbolic differential equations are often solved numerically by time stepping algorithms. These algorithms have been regarded as sequential in time. That is, the solution on a time level must be known before the computation for the next time level concern. While this remains true in principle, we demonstrate that it is possible for processes to perform useful work on many time levels simultaneously. There was earlier work by Salt and Knight. And so the idea here is that you solve the time stepping equation iteratively like Jacobi or gauss seidel like in Hackbusch. But then you start to iterate on next levels already before the earlier level has finished. So here I take again the same example that I had for Hackbusch. This would be a deep equation. You write this as a matrix equation. You discretize with Euler and you discretize with trace. You get a matrix equation of this form. And now you do again the L, D, U decomposition. And then, for example, you can take gauss seidel on the left, and you put the U on the right, and you iterate. And what you normally do is you iterate this to convergence up to a capital K, and then you go to the next one. Which means this one must have converged at capital K before you go to the next time step N. The N minus one must have converged. And what Womble now says, forget about it. We don't wait until this step has converged. We just take whatever it produced, and we start already iterating at this step. This is different from Hackbusch. Hackbusch did his smoother sequentially. This Womble just iterates everywhere. And he has a convergence analysis. He shows that this converges as fast as if you just did it on one level. And there is a big error in this analysis. <laughs> he did not observe that the matrices are non-normal. So his analysis does not predict the real convergence. 
Fitting das ein Topic aus? Natürlich, das Paper bei Chef Mandem und Otto Schulz und Sagler. It goes here and then it shows that there is very little to gain. Nevertheless, it still gets beat up for a complicated problem because the iteration is not such a good iteration. So if you have a very slow method, and if you do this, you can gain some speed up. But nothing compared to if you have a good method to solve. So that was a, a failure, unfortunately. Then there's time parallel cyclic reduction. That's also a very cool idea. This is by Worley in 1991. Analyzing across time when solving time-dependent partial differential equations. And you see, it's amazing how many people actually thought about this before all these computers came along. So he says, the wave normalization multigrid algorithm is normally implemented in a fashion that is still intrinsically sequential in the time direction. Its computation in the time direction only involves solving linear scalar ODs. If the ODs are solved using a linear multi-step method with a statically determined time step, then each OD solution corresponds to the solution of a banded lower triangular matrix, or equivalent of a linear recurrence. Parallelizing a linear recurrence equation has been studied extensively. In particular, if a cyclic reduction approach is used to parallelize the linear recurrence, then parallelism is introduced without increasing the order of the scalar complexity. That's also a complicated statement, so I make a small example. So suppose we have this by diagonal matrix equation to solve. And this could be a time stepping, you know, if you do Euler, forward or backward Euler, you get exactly the matrix of these forms with these unknowns on the right hand side. Now what is cyclic reduction? Cyclic reduction means that you eliminate every second unknown such to result in elimination. So what you do here, you eliminate the unknown one. So you use the first equation you can solve was the unknown one, and you introduce it here, and then this equation has disappeared. This, this equation for this unknown, you don't have it anymore. And you also solve for the equation three. So here you have the equation three, you solve and you substitute. You get only a system for half of the unknown. And here I just calculated what the terms are. You can see these are Gaussian elimination terms. Pretty general. So now this system is only half the size, and I can do this recursively. Because I can do it recursively, this becomes a log. And all these steps are parallel. All these eliminations I can do in parallel. One and three I can eliminate simultaneously. That's cyclic reduction. And then one can back substitute. And again, when you go up the tree, you only have a log complexity. So you remove an n and you transform it into a log n complexity. And it's fully parallel. If you do it sequentially, it's not good. Sequentially, for my example, the bidiagonal one, the complexity is 3n. You just go through by substitution. The cyclic reduction is 7n, or if you optimize it, 5n for certain pre-computed quantities. But if you do this in the three-way in parallel, it becomes a logarithm. And there are very good algorithms for these things. So this in combination with wave normalization is just a good, a good algorithm. And it's a direct method. It's not iterative. You just collapse it. And you go back to the tree and build it. This is also implemented only two weeks ago, and it really does work well. This is the last one I implemented <laughs> a few weeks ago as well. This is Laplace transform. And that one was hard. It took me two days to get that to work. Even though the description was good, but it was just more complicated to code. So this is an idea that goes back to Sheen, Sloan, and Tomei in 2000. They say these problems are completely independent and can therefore be computed on a separate topic with no need for shared memory. In contrast, the normal step-by-step -step time marching methods for parabolic problems are not easily parallelizable. And the idea is to use a Laplace transform to solve the problem, which means your problem must be linear and constant collision. So there's a big constraint here. It's a direct method that works for a, a small class of problems. And the idea is simple to explain. So if you have, who has heard about Laplace transforms, by the way? Now, now there should be some, some hands going up, I guess. Laplace transform is something you learn in many courses. So, so Laplace transform, if you have a system of ODs, so Laplace transform is the, the time derivative becomes a multiplication by this Laplace transform time. And your initial condition appears in the equation. So instead of solving this equation in time, you can solve this equation in Laplace space. But then you need to inverse Laplace transform. Inverse Laplace transform, you need to find a contour to integrate. You have your transform solution. You multiply by the Laplace transform uh, formula. Uh, you have these 
divide by one, divide by two, by i, and then you get your solution. So this is all exact. If this is your problem, this is the exact solution. And to make this into a numerical method, the only thing which is left to do, you have to discretize this integral. And discretizing this integral means you have to find a quadrature formula. You have to decide on a, on a quadrature. Then you have to find a quadrature formula. And then you have to evaluate at your quadrature points, which are different points x, this u hat. And you see this u hat we solve from here. It's an s plus a inverted applied to u0. So this means you have to solve a problem that involves your matrix A, which are just x. So at each Laplace transform point that you have in the quadrature formula, you have to solve a system. But these are all independent. Once you know the quadrature points, all these systems can be solved independently. That's where the parallelism comes from. So you put a quadrature formula here, you choose a contour, you get a parallel method. And uh, they chose a, a contour which is just a cone. <coughs> and there are better contours. There's a Talbot contour. I realized later that I had implemented one on the Talbot contour I could have reused, but I implemented exactly their method. It does work, but these some of these systems are not too easy to solve if the S has a bad value on your contour. And so iterative solution can be difficult. And it's also restricted to constant systems. Otherwise, it would be the Laplace transform doesn't work. But if it works, you can get a good solver out of this. This is even less probable to work. <laughs> it, it gets worse and worse. I mean, th this, this is uh, Yvon Madé again, who's another collaborator. That's the one who invented Parareal. And he says, pour briser la nature intrinsèquement séquentielle de cette résolution, on utilise l'algorithme de produit tensoriel rapide. What did they do? So if I take here a heat equation, I discretize by backward dialers, I write the system at all time levels simultaneously, the system we've seen now many, many times. So you get a block by diagonal system, block by diagonal, with those blocks in everywhere. On the right hand side with the initial condition. And this I can write with a Kronach symbol. I can write this in the form B times the identity in X, where B is the time stepping matrix. And then identity in T, Kronecker L, where L is the Laplacian. It's because we have this space time uh, Kronecker uh, structure. Now there is something very important here. You see there is not a delta T, but there's a delta T1, delta T2, delta T3. So all my time steps are different. So why did I do this? Why did I not put the same time step? So because if I have the time same time step, that method does not work. So here is the B matrix. You see this is a time stepping matrix, delta T1, delta T2. This is exactly the time step of a backward dialer. And so, oh, somebody's knocking on the door. Nope. So what this method assumes is that you can diagonalize this matrix. Now, if the time step was the same everywhere, you see this is a triangular matrix. And if there is the same value on the diagonal, this is a Jordan block. Jordan blocks cannot be diagonalized by definition. That's why you need to have a different time step. If the time step is different, then you can diagonalize it. And so suppose you can diagonalize this matrix. Then you can diagonalize the Kronecker structure of the space-time problem. So it's written here in the diagonalized structure. And you see, by miracle, there are three problems here. There is this operator here that acts on something. Keep going up. Then there is this operator that acts on something. Keep going right hand side. And there is the last one. So this can be solved in three steps. You can first obtain B by solving this. This is basically a smooth tight transform. And then you have all these which are now diagonal, like in the Laplace. Okay? All the spatial operators are diagonal. And then you can do the inverse step. So the idea is clever. I studied this method very carefully. And I can show that 
if the time steps are not enough different, then you get round of error. And your method produces garbage. And if they are very different, then the truncation error of the discretization is garbage. So you also get garbage. So you're in between this garbage and in between that garbage, and then you can optimize to minimize, and there is an optimal choice for the time step stretching, such that you can get it to work. And you can get about 14 to 15 time levels in parallel, and not more. If you get more, you, you, your best choice is already at order one error. So this by itself is a method where you can parallelize, but, but not that well. So I thought this is not going anywhere as a method. I don't know if I have my next slide. Yeah, I have my next slide. So this, these are the results I just told you. But then a former postdoc of mine said, I have a really, really good method. <laughs> I do di diagonalization and use the same time step. There's no way, you cannot diagonalize. And he said, no, but I changed it. So he takes the same time step, and it just makes the matrix a little wrong. He adds another element to it, and then alpha is random. And now suddenly, you know, if alpha is one, this is a cyclic matrix. But this you can diagonalize by Fourier transform, that's well put, it's orthogonal. But the matrix is wrong now. But if you make alpha smaller, then it gets less and less wrong. If alpha was zero, this is exactly the time-stepping matrix. But then it can iterate on this. <laughs> and this is the fastest method they have in China at the moment. He solves on the three million supercomputer the most complicated problems with this. He tested all of them. And for problems which are not the heat equation for which I've shown you the other algorithm, this is a really, really good method. It's very hard to beat. This was invented at the same time by Andy Watson in Oxford. But he didn't know you can put an alpha. If you put a one here, it's still not bad, but it's much worse than if you put an alpha here. And then it was invented again by Daniel Kressner in Lausanne, who does a different interpolation technique. This is going much further than I thought. I thought this is really going nowhere. And this shows you in research that sometimes you just, you just need another idea or some other thing, and somebody is good will come up with it. But that's very impressive. So all this difficulty I had with this round of error analysis and everything is all gone. There is only one bad thing. If alpha is really small, like 10 to the minus 4, 10 to the minus 5, there is again a round of issue coming in when you denialize it with Julian. So Julian says you should choose 0 0.01. That's a good choice. And he just does this. There is Riddick. I think I'm not going to show Riddick. <laughs> It's a cool method. It's similar to predictor corrector, but it does it differently. So you also get this, this front, which becomes more and more white. It's a multi-core method. It's a cool method. I just explained ParaX because this is a method that I developed with a postdoc, Stefan Güttel. And I, I like the idea because it's, it's based on a, a rational trial of approximation, which, which is well established, and it's a really different method. It's only working for a constant coefficient. We have now a variable coefficient one as well, but I explained it's a constant coefficient case. And it's linear. So here is a linear problem. This could be a wave equation or a heat equation. And recall for wave equation, we don't have that many methods that are good. But waveform relaxation does do it. That is very good. So para x, what it does, it's also based on a decomposition like a para real into subinterval. And it's a direct method, so it solves this with a direct method. It's a two-step procedure. It solves red problems followed by blue problems. So what are the red problems? The red problems, they all start at the zero initial value. <coughs> and they solve on the interval the entire problem. So these are the V problems. I call them V. On each interval, I have the original problem. But I start with the wrong initial guess, zero. So these I can all do in parallel. And then I have to solve the blue problems. And the blue problems are homogeneous problems. There is no source anymore. But now as the starting value, I use what these red problems computed. So the blue problems start at the initial value, at this value, at this value, and at this value. And they have to compute over the entire time interval. And then you say, wait a moment. This solution here, 
this is as bad as my original problem. I calculate from T0 to T4. It's a wave equation. There's no way I can gain anything because I have to solve the problem on the entire tangent. But that's not true because this is a homogeneous problem. There's no source. And these problems can be approximated very cheaply with rational styles like this. And that was certainly the source here when we built it. So para x first solves all red problems in parallel, then solves all blue problems in parallel, and then just sums up by linearity to get the solution. And this is a very, very good algorithm for uh, hyperbolic problems. So here is an example. This is the wave, wave equation. So here has the wave equation with different wave groups, alpha squared. Here in the table are different wave speeds. And there is an oscillatory source which oscillates at different frequencies f. And we have boundary conditions and initial conditions which are zero here in this wave equation separate to get to a certain error. And then we perform the calculation in parallel. And then we have two times. We have times for the red problem, maximum of the red problem, maximum of the blue problem, and then the sum and the error of the para x algorithm. And if you look, the blue problems here, they're very, very cheap, even though they go over much longer time intervals than the red problems. The red problems are 10 to the minus 1. The blue problems are 10 to the minus 2. And this goes for many different wave speeds, many different source terms. And with this, we get for wave equation speed ups that are spectacular for wave equations that calculate all this in parallel. You get performances like 70%, 75%. This is very, very good efficiency. <coughs> this also works for heat equations. You get even slightly better performance. And it's a fairly good algorithm. I try to get the variance for nonlinear problems. And then you have to iterate because it's nonlinear. And it turns out this gives you a parallel method where the coarse problem is a para x problem. <laughs> this is really weird. Uh, it's surprising. So to conclude, I've shown you a lot of stuff today. This is a summary. So we had the magenta method based on multiple shooting. And that's where parallel is coming out. This is one of the good algorithms for parabolic problems. For hyperbolic problems, this is really hard to make to work. Then there are the domain decomposition methods. They are good for diffusive problems. They are good for hyperbolic problems if you arrange the computation well. They are better now than 10 pitching, which I did not explain, which was so far the best method for Maxwell, for example, in space time. Then there is space time multigrid method, very, very good for parabolic problems. There is this algorithm that I've shown you that I developed with Martin Neumann, which is, in my opinion, the best for this type of problem. And there are many, many direct time parallel methods that were developed over time. And this paradiac family, this one with the alpha over delta t, this is one that goes much further. This you should watch out for. There's a strong research community. There's an annual print workshop. If you work in this area, you should go to this workshop. And uh, I'd like to advertise two books. These are two books that are finished. There is a first book that does numerical analysis of partial differential equations that I wrote uh, a few years ago which gives you basically the introduction to the ODs and PD stability with much more than what I showed in this course. Then there is a method, uh, a book on iterative methods and preconditions for system of linear equations. Here you'll learn all these domain decomposition, Dirich von Neumann, on simple problems in the style that was I was talking. And there's a third book, which is on time parallelization, which is not out yet. That's why I cannot advertise it with a picture, <coughs> but it's almost ready. I'm working on the last, uh, last section. And, uh, I still have to implement Riddick, for example, which I was too tired to explain now. So thanks a lot. Yes, so for many types of equations, we have formulas from analysis. For example, for a wave equation, I know. For a heat equation, I know. For advection reaction diffusion, I know. I also know for uh, shallow water. I know for Maxwell. And uh, in principle, you can just take them from the publication. There is, in general, a theorem that says the best parameter to choose is T0. 
star equals, and there's a formula that contains the parameters in your equation. Where is the, for example, the fusivity advection parameters? And then you get fast performance for the same cost that you had in the classical Dirichlet condition. If there is a new equation, then I would be interested to know because I'd like to develop the best parameter. So it's an established technique somehow. And in the book I'm writing, we actually describe how, how to get to this optimized parameter. Yes, for example, fluid structure, yeah. the technique still works. If it's nonlinear, we have to base it on a linearization, but we still get good approximate values. And there's also a lot of papers you can write about this because if you have a specific coupling of two different, we, we did coupling of like parabolic, hyperbolic, elliptic, parabolic, and we did like uh, constant, non-constant. We, we looked at jumping coefficients. We looked at many heterogeneous ones as well. As well yeah. So the technique basically is established, but maybe for your equation one has to develop yeah. parameters. Yes, you get an asymptotic formula, which is good when the mesh size is becoming small. So it's a formula that gives you, it's a closed for formula. For example, for a Laplace equation, it's just one over the mesh size to the power one third if you have a, a mesh overlap and to the power one half if there is no overlap. And this is just calculated by asymptotic analysis. Yeah. Yes? This is an excellent question. This was Gene Golub who actually told me when I gave a talk about this. He says, don't you know about box press? And I didn't know about box press. And he said, just, just go and look. And so I looked, there is a, a result by a box press who gets an analysis which looks very similar to what I get. He also gets a factor that gives this contraction. And then he says, we choose in every iteration another parameter. And he gives a formula for the best parameter if you have like eight iterations or 17 iterations. And then I can get contractions that are much better, but I have to cycle through this, this, uh, this cycle of parameters. And, but there are formulas for this. So there is a paper, one of my papers with Gene Golub, where it was essential that we, he said this and, and it became a paper because, because an essential idea. So it's a very good idea. If you, if you, if you use a different parameter, you can get a much better performance. So, and there is analysis for how to choose them. But a very nice question. You can find it on my webpage. One of the papers is being involved. Yeah, sometimes it's very valuable to have somebody who just knows so much and, and teaches us something. And, and then, it, then it goes somewhere. Yeah. Okay, thanks a lot.